Or is it happy? Maybe it's happy. Uh, give me, give me two minutes. Uh, I'm just setting stuff up right now. Give me two minutes, chat. Alright, alright, okay, we're ready. We are ready. This is a big day. This is a big day. I should be wearing a suit. I'm not wearing a suit. But as someone who has cared about pyramids for over a year now and tried to look up and tried to understand as much as I can as just a Atrek Mania streamer about the pyramids, today is a massive day. Today, we might get some answers. At least that's what History for Granted says. A pyramid YouTuber who's made countless videos on all kinds of details about the pyramids. He himself... Can't wait to hear new pyramid law plink. He himself has even uh, found and understood things about the pyramids that no Egyptologist, no researcher, no scientific paper writer has ever seen. Things in the Bent Pyramid, things about the Great Pyramid, and so on and so forth. It's not going to be aliens, it's not going to be any conspiracy things, don't think I'm crazy. I'm not, but we are literally at the right place, I believe, in the right time of history. I think if you care about pyramids, you just spawned in in the perfect timeline where it has been a mystery, but we might get to see the answer. We might get to, to have the understanding. We might get to be wi bear witness to our final understanding of how the Egyptians did what they did some 4,500 years ago. It's kind of insane, and I want to hopefully, uh, in this we have about one hour before the video from History for Granite is published, I want to kind of take that one hour to try to put into context, like, why it matters, why I care so much, why History for Granite cares, why, why people care about this. And why what History for Granted is going to present could be, like, monumental. It will certainly bring us closer. I'm not sure if it will be, like, a definitive, but it will certainly bring us closer. I think the only definitive answers we can get rely on the uh, Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt. Uh, they, they will have to actually, like, dig through walls in the pyramid. And I don't see them doing that, but... But from a distant observer point of view, this is, you know, some of the best you can do. So, everybody, welcome to the stream. Let's let's just get into it, okay? We shall start with watching the um, video that History for Granted posted the other day, okay? This video has one million views. It is a preview of, of like, literally a teaser for, for the video he's posting today. And I think we should watch this. It's just called The Great Pyramid Has Changed. Let's start by watching this. The Great Pyramid Has Changed. I see it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. 
These are the shafts Much inside the queen's chamber. Is lost, for none now live who remember it. Which will be the main focus point of this video later today. Four thousand years. Not ago, subbed. I'm on my second YouTube account. I, I am subbed, collapsed. but I can sub again. With it, the age of colossal stone pyramids <laughs> came swiftly. On my main to account, I am subbed. The century which followed was a time of conflict and chaos. The pyramids were ransacked, their secrets forgotten. With this desecration, the pyramids ceased to be seen as eternal. The mud they brick ones that followed were reduced to concealing their layouts, knowing robbers would someday come looking. In this hopeless pursuit of I've security, tried to understood what he's the saying secret here. of the old kingdom was forgotten. Like, like, what's very interesting about the pyramids is that the Great Pyramid was one of the first they built and also one of the most grand. Later pyramids were not as impressive, both in height, I mean, the Great Pyramid is the tallest one, but also in internal structure, which I'll show you guys in a second. The internal structure of this pyramid, one of the oldest ones, it was one of the best. And they only get less and less complex as time moves on. And so, um, people have thought, why did they get worse and worse? And that's kind of what he's referencing here. It's like, when the pyramids were robbed, they were ceased to see them as an eternal. And then the mud brick ones that came after were just kind of trying to hide where the pharaoh was buried. A mystery to torment everyone seeking answers in the Great Pyramid. The Channels. Four small conduits built into the Great Pyramid itself. Two in the king's chamber, About an arm two in with the queen's size, chamber. The channels. No other pyramid has them. No writings or context for them has ever been uncovered. So forgotten were these channels that the queen's chamber pair weren't discovered until 1872. Fascinating but stories about this that I will tell you guys about. deepened the mystery as they were built with all four ends uncut. A dead end for Egyptology. This is the end of the channel. Conclusion they drilled in here in 2002. But I think. now, this 4,000 year old mystery is coming to an end. On History for Granite, we are going to solve this puzzle and bring the pyramids back to their forgotten glory. New evidence written in stone, never before documented in any publication. Like, it's so fascinating. Ultimate clues to take us back in time to see what the ancient Egyptians were really up to. The builders of the Great Pyramid were far more clever than anyone has guessed. And very soon, the world will know how bold Egypt's mighty old kingdom truly was. So, so a lot of people, when they hear this, we will uncover the truth. We will find the answer. We will show the world how bold Egypt's might, uh, Egypt's might truly was. You might hear this and meet it with skepticism, and you should. You should be skeptical. You should be thinking, like, could this one YouTuber with 180k subs really be onto an answer that Egyptologists for years have not found, right? You should meet it with skepticism. But I don't doubt it, and I will explain why um, I don't doubt it with what History for Granite has done already and why I think when he truly says confidently he has solved it, I, I do think he has. I do think he has. Um, so a couple of a couple of fun stories, right? He's talking about how the Great Pyramid is complex and compared to later ones, like, like this compared to the absolutely earth-shattering, completely beautiful construction that it's the Great Pyramid, doesn't really look very impressive. But uh, a lot of the later pyramids look like this, or at least their versions that we have remaining now. Um, the shafts, these are what he's going to tackle in the video that he's posting today. And uh, just to understand what these are, there's an internal map of the pyramids. This one is very commonly used. It's from the Encyclopedia Britannica, but it's actually wrong in a lot of ways. Uh, but you have, you have the internal structure here. So, real quick, let's just explain what we're looking at. The entrance is on the right side here, the north face. This is where you enter as a tourist and also originally. You enter through like a tunnel where my uh, cursor is, you get to the ascending passageway. You walk up, you walk through the grand gallery and you get to the king's chamber. This is where the pharaoh Khufu, Khufu was buried. But the Egyptians also made the queen's chamber down here, which is just a lot of extra work for a room that didn't seem to have any clear purpose. There was no sarcophagus there, no one was buried in here. Uh, and also the subterranean chamber. N no sarcophagus, just a hollowed outcrop that they kind of left there. Why, why did they do these things? And then you have this escape shaft. It's actually a, a well shaft is what they call it now. And then these air shafts. Um, what were they for? 
Well, as as common Egyptology has it, the main theory is that these were pointing towards the the sky, and some people even think they were pointing towards the stars, towards um, Osiris, and towards another star, and that they would send the king spirit to the great waters in the sky, to the afterlife, and and become part of the universe that way. So they would seal the pyramid so that only his spirit could escape these ways. Um, first of all, about the stars, these these shafts are grossly oversimplified here. They actually twist and turn a lot. So they look more like a spaghetti than, uh, than a straight line. And they're not angled uh, correctly to line up with the stars either. Um, also, the Queen's Chamber ones never reach the outside. I actually made an updated map here to show more or less what it looks like in reality. Which is uh, quite far from this. So this is the uh, old map from Encyclopedia Britannica and... Uh, wait a second. I think, yeah, this is the updated map <laughs> to show kind of what what's missing from their drawing. The Queen's Chamber shafts never reach the outside. They just stop at a random point. And I've also marked two more things on this drawing. I have marked the SPNFC. This is the Scan Pyramid's North Face Corridor where they scan the pyramid for more empty... Um, empty spaces, and they found this corridor. This was explored in March of 2023. And they also found the Big Void. This is a room about 40 meters in size that no one has entered in the pyramid. It looks like this uh, line is traversing right through it, but it's actually uh, quite far apart in, in distance. Um, it, this is a 2D drawing, and in 3D this is not overlapping. Uh, but it's located directly above the Grand Gallery. And uh, people have speculated what this room is for, but it, it's confirmed to be there. So this room could house more understanding to the, um, you know, the, the mystery of the pyramids, but we, we won't know because it's very precarious to try to enter this room. You'd have to dig through about 10 meters of stone and Egypt likes their pyramids. They don't want to grief their own pyramid and ruin their biggest tourist attraction. So it's very unlikely we will ever dig through here. I, I doubt they will um, make that happen. Uh, Egypt, but but it's still there, and I really hope we get to see it one day. But the shafts, right? That's what he's going to talk about. So, um, let's run through a few things. Look at how complex this internal structure is compared to some of the older pyramids. Uh, or some of the, the, the more recent pyramids. This is the Pyramid of Khufu. Khufu's heir to the throne was uh, Khafra, and he built the pyramid next to it. That's the one you see in the middle of the Giza Plateau. Uh, look at the internal structure of this. Isn't that insane? One generation later and they build this. And it's not its not at all like... Not impressive. It's a, it's a beautiful pyramid. Pyramid of Khafra. Like this is a magnificent pyramid. And it appears to be the tallest one on the plateau. Uh, it's also centered with the Sphinx. So it looks like yeah, a lot of photographies are taken like this. But the oldest one is Khufu's. And you can see it quite uh, clearly, I think, in this picture. Where Khafra's one appears taller because it's built on an incline. It's built on a higher part of the hill than Khufu's one. But Khufu's one is the oldest and most complex internally. You also have the Pyramid of Menkara, which is 65 meters. And that one was built a little while after this one again. And it too is just not at all complex inside. They built most of the passages underground and then just piled a rubble of rocks on top. So the pyramids keep getting less and less complex. And I wonder, like, th th there's many theories about this, right? But a bit, an important thing for, um, for the Egyptians was to not have the tombs be robbed. And so a lot of the pyramids have these, like, fake chambers and antechambers and they, they really you know tried to protect the pharaoh so that grave robbers couldn't come through it could be that they realized at some point like even if you go through all this effort and you still get griefed you might as well just not <laughs> put in that much effort i don't know right but 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 it's it's a reality that uh, and they've scanned these ones if you're curious they have scanned these ones they have not found any cavities inside at least the um pyramid of Khafra. 
Okay, moving on. Let's 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 move forward. Um, the big void, by the way. Um, fascinating. Um, fascinating stuff about this. This exists. The North Face Corridor has been explored. It was somewhat uninteresting, apart from the fact that it proved the technology. And they also made uh, a video about it, Scan Pyramids. And I thought I thought we'd watch a few minutes of this. This is how they discovered them, 2016 and 2017. So they use muon te tomography, space particles that fly onto a reflector in the pyramids, and then uh, they can measure what they've flown through and where there are gaps. It's a uh, oversimplification, but that's how I understood it. Really smart. Smart people. So these are the the reflectors that things fly to, and they can, yeah, they can scan the pyramid this way. <laughs> and this is another technique that they used in the queen's chamber to look basically just up. And then the different scans and the different methods all found the same thing. The unknown void. SP big void. <laughs> it has such a it has such a intriguing name. The big void. What is that? Feels like I'm back at school today, but I'm actually learning something. Today you're with me. And today we're gonna learn a lot of fun things about the pyramids. We're not gonna get caught in the boring things. Only fun things. Only, you know, I want to make more people interested in this. The void was also detected from an outside scan. Like, they have found this void from so many angles. It's there. It's actually there. Like this, this room exists. When it was first discovered though, I just want you to, when it was first discovered, the guy who was the head of the Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt meant that this was a conspiracy only, only done to support a guy he disagreed with theories. So he disagrees with an architect called Jean-Pierre Houdin, and he thought that, you know, this is, where's the evidence? This is so stupid. You're just trying to corroborate this crazy lunatic from France who thinks there was an internal ramp or something. But they're fully right. They're just doing the science. The science is there. This exists. Look at this. Look at this. They worked independently, and the confidence level, higher than 99.99999% it's above five sigma level. And you can tell these guys are pretty sigma. There's a pretty sigma research going on right now. Sigma five level research. I hope to live one day to see this room export. 47 meters wide room, eight meters tall, or long, sorry. It's about two and a half meters wide. No, sorry, f uh, on, yeah, five, five, four or five meters wide on each side. So two and a half meters on each side. And they, they don't know the exact angle of it yet. So that's one thing that, that remains to be uncovered. But yeah, uh, cool, cool video. And amazing stuff that Scan Pyramids Mission is doing. We applaud them for their amazing research. Um, now a little bit about history for granted, just to give you context in, in what he kind of does, and also the, the backstory of, of why he's so passionate about this, I think. Let's take a look at um, one of his most successful videos, the closest look at how the pyramids were built. In this one, he looks at the middle pyramid, Pyramid of Khafra, not the oldest one. Because this one, importantly, still has casing stones. The pyramids were built in a way where they placed the, the, 
the nicest stones on the outside, and then kind of the things you couldn't see, they were like, you know, not the, not the coolest stones. But they placed really beautiful, chiseled, carved stones on the outside to make it look very pretty. From my original survey. And on the original one, they have all fallen off or been taken off to be used in building in Cairo. But these ones are inaccessible one and at the top. The highest pyramid courses have gaps between stones. <laughs> yeah, it's it's div one stones on the outside and then div two stones on the inside. Really correct analogy chat. And then you got like div, the, the further in you go, the, the lower div the stones are. Have held scaffolding <laughs> and afterwards been filled with small stones or mortar, which has eroded away. Another was that blocks of a particular shape were used to bond groups of casing stones together, particularly in joining the largest corner blocks with the more regular sized stones in the middle. These bonding blocks. So, what he's saying here, and what he noticed by looking at all the 7,000 casing stones on the outside of the pyramid, is that. They follow a particular pattern. He has just lined them out here. He has not like drawn anything that isn't there. Um, they use the orange and green ones on the outside layers, stacking like um, long one this like long one upwards in the frame, and then long one sideways up long so that it has more stability. Uh, they filled in with blue. That's basically a filler stones, and these red ones have a particular angle. If you notice, they are not like straight but they're kind of like um what do you call the shape what do you call the shape when they're like concave no not it's a, it's a trapezoid thank you they have an angle they, they have a slight angle slight diagonal angle sometimes on one side sometimes on both sides and he he speculated what these stones could be for like why not you might think if you build a pyramid you would want only like flat rectangular perfect stones but some of them have this angle and what the case he makes in this video is that you know first he wants better pictures so he travels to egypt but you're not actually allowed to take uh, commercial pictures uh, at the pyramids you're not allowed to bring a tripod and place your camera uh, without special permission from from the authorities they have guards there that will escort you away from the pyramid location if you uh, show up with with a too advanced camera. You can take you can bring your phone, but not a not a tripod or anything. So he sneakily brings a tripod and takes pictures when the guards aren't looking, and he gets these beautiful pictures of the pyramid from far away. So now I can look at all the casing stones on three of the sides, not four. He then looks at some stuff, and later in this video, he concludes that by by mapping out all the stones that he can confidently assert are these. Trapezoid stones, these bonding stones as he called them. Bonding stone always needed a downward tapered edge and a smaller than he average concludes size for its course. That with the way they are laid out, each course matters it's a similar pattern on each side. With different heights and these must be the last stones that were placed stone. on each casing stone layer. The most probable bonding stone. And it confidently asserts that they couldn't have used an external ramp for the casing stones. Stones identified. The building pattern of the pyramid emerged, lost for four and a half thousand years. We can now see the exact... What you are looking at, if this is the last stone of each layer, if the, the red ones are the last ones, because you... I, I might have forgotten to, to explain this, but the reason they would be the last ones is because you can slot them into place. Uh, he explains that in the middle here. If you placed all the stones and you had one stone left and you had to place like a square, you might risk pushing the stones off the, off the edge. You might risk uh, the stone not fitting and having to, to cut it better and whatnot. But by having this edge and placing it on top, you can kind of slide it into place from above. And when you look at this pattern, you can see this, Locations not just on the north face, to join finished but on every side Starting that he took a picture side, of. Starting on the north side, you see them run vertically up the pyramid and join together as the surface area decreases. The horizontal spacing between streams of bonding stones is consistent until they sharply converge upon one another. It's breathtaking to see the ancient past emerge this way, hidden in plain sight since the dawn of civilization. It, it is. Looking at the east face of the um, pyramid, a similar pattern of bonding stones is seen. Notably, the streaks of bonding stones converge down to two at the same elevation near the top.
So he, he's done this for all the sides. Finally, the south face of the pyramid shows the same general layout as the others. And by comparing these three patterns, we can reach some important conclusions about pyramid construction. And here he uh, talks about the about building models. Construction. The first conclusion is that for Khafre's pyramid at this high elevation, there was no primary external access point or ramp that would distinguish one face from another. If this were the case, the bonding stones would not follow the same pattern on all sides. The western face remains less certain, but the layout of the Giza Plateau makes it an unlikely candidate for such so a design. So if there was a ramp, these stones Next, would not follow the same the pattern? Of each they would like staircase upwards, like a spiral. Proving the center lines were but they don't spiral upwards. Point for the casing stones rather they than somehow ladder ones. upwards. This eliminates the center lines as a point of external access. Furthermore, the corners of the pyramid do not always have bonding stones near them, even though they are frequently found there. What these patterns show is that when laying the casing stones near the top of Khafre's pyramid, there was no external structure or a ramp obscuring the faces. The builders wouldn't always set casing stones from the center of a face outward if there was any external obstruction. The bonding stones would have clustered at the uh, location. If you do something like this, to get more ramps, to get more people up, you are actively blocking the view of the pyramid. Yeah, so the geometry is going to be horrible, first of all. But um, like you're not going to get a clean, uh, precise pyramid. But also, the, these bonding stones would be in different places. Location of an access ramp before it was elevated. And here you can see the, the, the spiral pattern. Like this is how it course. would look. But that never happened and there is no evidence for an external ramp on the casing stones. The largest casing stones were the corner blocks and they were set early. Next, stones were laid from the center outwards with additional starting points in between the center and the corners as space allowed for. So, so this is research that History for Granted has done. He, he's really passionate about this and it's nothing to do with aliens. It's nothing to do with like, oh, they had an ancient civilization with giants and mammoths and you know, they floated the rocks up to the surface. Like, this is just looking at what's there, looking at the evidence in stone, you know? And a lot of people might ask, and, and with every video he makes, it's like, how could Egyptologists not uncover this before him? Like, how is he the first to look at this stuff? And he actually answered this in one of his other videos here, where he found something in the Bent Pyramid, and, and he tackles this question. So let's hear what he has to say about that. In this video will provoke is, why hasn't Egyptology done this work before? That's not a question I have a satisfying answer for, but I will point out a few key observations. Counterintuitively, Egyptology has not shown much interest in studying pyramids for the past century. Having made enormous progress in deciphering hieroglyphics, the field of study shifted towards emphasizing textual evidence above all other forms. The large pyramids of the 4th dynasty famously do not contain inscribed texts, and thus a common viewpoint is there isn't much left to learn. So basically what he's saying is, and this is true, that like they've looked at all the hieroglyphs that there are and all the cartouches, which are these like old drawings before hieroglyphs, um, that are in the pyramids, and they feel there isn't much left to learn from the texts. And since there's no texts and there's no tools or weapons left to be found or anything like this, what's left to learn about the pyramids like uh, which is fair like where do you even go from there but it's kind of history for granite and some other people that are doing this research where they're looking at the stones themselves how they were placed trying to figure out what purpose they had etc and then reaching these conclusions but to egyptology this is like a solved field they have the answer and if you feel like you have the answer to something it's very hard to uh see past that in fact, I can give a Trekmania example. The, the Trekmania maps in recent years that have been shortcut the most are maps that already have shortcuts. So like when people find one shortcut, you stop there and you don't look for the next shortcut. It's very rare that a map that has no shortcuts at all does get, get a new one, but, but you kind of settle on an, a satisfying answer and then you don't look further beyond that. In this video, by the way, I mean... This is an amazing video. <laughs> this is an amazing video because uh, what, what he shows here is that uh, in the 60s, in the 19 or 1860s, I think it was 1960s. Or was it? No, it must have been 1860s. Yeah. Um, 
that people mapped out the internal structure of the Bent Pyramid, an older pyramid. And what they found inside was this, this chimney structure. I'm seeing if I'm... I'm just going to scroll through it here. Uh, no, these, these are the chambers leading in. Uh, yeah, here. This is the chimney. So this is a feature inside the Bent Pyramid that you find in no other pyramid. Where you walk into a room, and then you look up, and there's just this huge thing going up here. And from the bottom of it, you can see one stone hanging out. And the people who mapped it out originally said there's another stone up here. And then people made theories about this. What, what are these stones for? And they thought, oh, it's, it's to, you know... Uh, they, they were making another chamber here, but they thought it was too hard to get the, the mummy up and everything, so they didn't. Uh, some people thought they were just trapdoors to kind of fool intruders. Um, and, he, and he's talking about it here. We can, we can watch a bit. Tree. But the chimney isn't just an empty shaft. It has architecture elements with no obvious point of comparison in other pyramids. Above the entrance to the chimney, there is a smaller corbelled passage nicknamed the window. Also, within the chimney are two ledges that each propped up a tall, smoothly dressed stone. Corbelled overhangs seem to protect the stones, as well as smaller ledges opposite the stones. With no frame of reference, an idea sometimes put forth is that the stones were meant to be tipped over onto the opposing small ledges. The fact that the lower stone remains upright, although pried outward a bit, is then put forth as evidence the chimney was never used. It's not a crazy idea, but it's still completely speculative, because no other portcullis system in ancient Egyptian burials looks like this. So I am one unaware of, of any mastaba or pyramid with a closing system that consisted of tipping over stones in such a manner. When trying to understand the intentions of ancient Egyptians, you have to be extremely cautious with your assumptions. The reason for caution is they would construct fake versions of real building designs as part of a funeral complex. Here's Egyptologist <laughs> Mark Lehner talking about dummy architecture at the Pyramid of Djoser. And it's surrounded by dummy buildings. Buildings that aren't real, don't have, you know, interior rooms and so on. They're basically facades filled with debris. Creating the simulacrum of a royal complex, it has an. They were basically just trying to to make decoy buildings and fool intruders and shit. They were literally trying to make sure that no grave robber got to the pharaoh, that he could rest in peace. Magical effect. As if it wasn't hard enough to understand ancient Egyptian architecture, they created fake stuff, which can confuse us even more. No wonder Egyptologists prefer it spelled out for them in hieroglyphics. So, so when you analyze the pyramid, it's hard to know, like, what's the Queen's Chamber, for example, if we go back to, if we go back to the, this drawing. Uh, was the Queen's Chamber in the Great Pyramid just a decoy room? Did it have a purpose? Uh, the air shafts, were they also some form of, like, oh, let's trick them into thinking there's a corridor here? Th those are only, like, as I said, this, the size of your hand. The subterranean chain, like... Trying to place a purpose on all this is very tricky, and it's, there's a reason why it hasn't been solved yet, but, but, but why we might be getting closer now with, apparently, what History for Granted has seen, which, by the way, 30 minutes left until we get some answers. I'm super excited. We're going to need some strong evidence to figure out what is up with the chimney. When studying MNR's map, a glaring problem arose. The lower chimney stone is reasonably documented. But, but what he did here, and what is so insane, is like... This is the Bent Pyramid, right? These are old Italian drawings of where the stones are at, what shape and size they have. And there's one stone that stands out to him that he did not like. Although MNR omit many details that can be seen in photos taken by the Aceta Project. Thanks again to them for sharing their images with us. The lower stone was tilted away from the wall, and it looks like mortar was glopped onto the side to prevent it from falling over. Clearly, looters at some point in history took an interest in this block. But what of the upper stone, perched so high this and stone. out of sight? Was it ever tipped over? Was it ever chiseled and smashed away? Since the so-called window allows access above the lower chimney stone, only the upper stone could have ever truly blocked it up as a passage. When reading MNR, there is only a brief description that would taunt me for years. Quote, 
On the east wall, there are clear traces of a block about 1.55 meters high, which stood traces on the floor of a block. and was symmetrical to the rough one we saw against <laughs> the west wall <laughs> of the lower small room. End quote. Traces of a block? What on earth does that mean? That must be the least helpful description and possible. And it's 15 meters Even up. Herodotus when you stand down there, it's 15 job. meters up. Traces and you see could be a traces pile of, of a block. pieces. It could be just impressions on the ledge where it was seated. It could be a mostly intact block. It could be just about anything. I have a sneaking suspicion M and R didn't get a good look at the top of the chimney because 15 meters is a long way up. I th so, so he realized, like, okay, what if the data is wrong? How could they have seen up there? How, how would you get a ladder up here? How would you get light up here back in, you know, quite ancient times, right? Uh, but you're not allowed to climb into the pyramids, you're not allowed to do this stuff, and it's a fantastic video, but basically, he goes there himself, brings an elongated selfie stick, I believe, he's never actually said what the equipment was, but it's tourist legal equipment, brings a really long selfie stick and a flash, and actually takes a picture up there and and finds out what's there and it's uh, it's what it is and i I, don't, I really don't want to like just you know i want to give as much credit as i can to history for granted you guys should totally check out his channels because all this stuff is super fascinating but i'm also trying to to make you understand like this is not just a youtuber saying guys i found out what's going on in the pyramids like he he goes and does in-person research himself he's literally just an independent scientist and a super fascinating thing here is that uh, <laughs> before he reveals what he saw up there, he first wants to tackle one of his doubters, who is an academic, he's a professional scientist, he has a peer-reviewed paper, and like, it's kind of, uh, yeah, well, just watch. But first I need to address someone who has been portraying wild speculation about the chimney as scientific inquiry. While many Egyptologists were wise enough to admit they simply didn't understand the chimney, researcher Franck Monnier <laughs> proclaimed he had all the answers. Literally addressing the it haters. It must be mentioned that while Monnier is credited in TV documentaries as an expert in Egyptian architecture, he is neither an architect nor an Egyptologist. He's just an independent researcher like me, working on his own ideas. Monnier thinks that because he <laughs> publishes his work in peer-reviewed journals, this gives him the authority to mock and dismiss YouTubers and their audience. This guy's gonna get so smoked. This is exactly I'll... what he did last year when I released my first I, I video see this part on again. the Bent Pyramid. He lamented that nobody paid attention to his paper he had linked in the comments, and thus you were all a bunch of uncurious fools. But now it's time to examine this paper before we reach- So he made a video, this research guy posts a paper, and he says nobody reaches, uh, reads it, which is the truth of the- pyramid and not this stupid video and now he's gonna look at this guy's paper our final destination at the top <laughs> of the chimney the article oh, is, is mostly spicy. a defense of mnr's hypothesis <laughs> about structural problems combined with the assertion that the lower chamber of the pyramid was abandoned in favor of building the i literally have chamber. popcorn shot of the chimney monnier writes in his conclusion quote by comparing the internal arrangements of the Medum pyramid and the bent pyramid it is clear that the chimney of the lower layout of the Bent Pyramid was undoubtedly planned as a route to reach a burial chamber. So stupid. End quote. The paper claims twice that there is no doubt about this purpose for the chimney, and the reason given is that, quote, The architect probably judged that the chimney was too perilous to allow access <laughs> to the funeral procession, and so an alternative arrangement had to be found. End quote. I can't imagine an explanation more insulting to the ancient Egyptians than this one. Monnier is claiming that the builders dug over 22 <laughs> meters down into the earth, constructed the most beautiful corbelled chamber ever made at the time, and then realized as they were setting the foundations to the pyramid that, oh no, we can't bring a mummy up this what? chimney. <laughs> no this way. paper was allegedly peer-reviewed, and I'll leave you to interpret that detail. Oh, we made such a mistake, guys. We did all this carving and then we forgot we can't bring it, we can't like actually finish the chamber up there? Shit, oh no. As you like. 
I think the goal of portraying the bent pyramid as a failure has biased Monier. Like, it's a beautiful construction, but, but it's seen as a failure pyramid. Specifically, by the way, that's why they call it the bent pyramid. Specifically because it has this change in incline on the, on the, the, the shape. So it started very steep and then it was uh, changed halfway. And it's not known whether that was intentional or not, but it's a like a lot of people think it's it's a failure. But yeah, portraying the bent pyramid as a failure has biased Monier, and this agenda-driven scholarship influenced Mark Lehner, who has not published papers on the bent pyramid. In the last year, Franck Monier was given the opportunity to inspect the bent pyramid and chimney in person as the historical consultant for a French TV documentary series. In this role, Monnier selected LIDAR scanning as the sole method of investigation. In doing so, Monnier can identify every conceivable imperfection in the stonework to characterize the pyramid as a failed project, which is the narrative presented in the documentary. When scanning the chimney, the LIDAR extension comes up a bit short and leaves a portcullis-sized really cool, yeah. hole in the data. The scan just barely grazes a portion of a stone still sitting on the upper ledge. The documentary then concludes the chimney must be an abandoned access route, assuming this fragment is what remains of a stone that was intended to be tipped over. Monnier set out to find evidence in support of his theory, and miraculously, and miraculously. that's all he discovers. <laughs> that's but all now he discovers. it is time for us to have a look. So he, he's not impressed by, okay, first of all, there's these... Um, Drawings that, well, how could they have seen it? Then there's this guy claiming it must be something which seems completely outrageous. And so he goes and checks it out for himself. And... Here. That hasn't been disturbed for 4,000 years. Starting with the smaller ledge opposite the block, we find the space is in remarkably good shape. The dressing layer of the walls is a bit rough. However, the ledge itself has been treated with more care. It's darker and smoother than the other nearby surfaces. The wall behind the ledge appears to bevel out slightly at the bottom, although this protrusion looks to be missing in the corners. It's difficult to speculate if this bevel was intentional. We, we don't have time to watch the entire thing. I do recommend you watch the entire thing. Basically, he does discover, though, that uh, the French guy was wrong. Uh, th this was not meant as some kind of... Uh, kind of... Um, like path to the the burial chamber but rather that because of the blocks used and how they have been chipped away at it, it is believed that the egyptians placed them there simply to troll people literally to troll people to think oh we we hid something important behind the stone go dig at it guys get your pickaxe and go hammer at it uh we promise there's something cool behind there we placed like granite there it must be good it's kind of like if you if you um in Minecraft, if you make a base out of obsidian under underground, and then you uh, you play some decoy obsidian blocks to make people think they're digging into your base, but there's just nothing there. Guys, I promise, if you if you use a TNT cannon and you blow up this base, you're gonna find something great inside there. Keep keep going, and it's a it's a it's a fake yeah. But anyways, um, a couple of things about what we're gonna be looking at today. It starts in in 20 minutes. It's going to mostly focus on the shafts, the air shafts. So let's go back to that. What we're focusing on is the Queen's Chamber and King's Chamber air shafts. Some stories about this. The Queen's Chamber air shafts weren't discovered and opened until 1872. And they were opened by a man called uh, Last Name Dixon. I, I forget his first name. Last Name Dixon, D-I-X-O-N. And he, uh, they were basically plugged up, and he, and he unplugged them. Queen's Chamber Air Shafts. Let me see if I can get a picture for you. Uh, this might be the King's Chamber one. Because it doesn't have the text. Yeah, that's granite. Okay, but basically they look like this. This might be the King's Chamber one. He reaches his hand inside it after uh, opening it, and he finds some he finds some items inside the shaft. Th this has not been opened since the pyramid was built. Okay, 
So Dixon reaches in, and what he finds is uh, a piece of wood, cedar wood. He finds a ball. He finds some hooks. And he finds... What was the, there was one more thing. Wait. Ah, here. And stone, I believe. Th this, this is what he found. Now, what's really interesting, to me at least, was this piece of wood. Because wood ha is radiocarbon datable. It is organic material. You can, tra you can trace when the, the, this object essentially died, when this tree was chopped. And they've, do they've done this, but this was not easy. This piece of wood uh, he brought home after his expedition. And then when he died, this was donated to the British Museum. But then it was lost in the British Museum archives. It's so like, uh, it, was, it was given a, a number, but when they went to check that number, it wasn't there. It got miscategorized. So when someone wanted to inspect this item in radiocarbon data in recent times, they couldn't find it. It was only found in 2020 again. It was only found in 2020, and I think they've been looking for it for a while. But they radiocarbon dated this. And this piece of wood radiocarbon dates to... I think it is about 500 years before the date the pyramids was built at. Wood was pretty scarce in Egypt, that's a possible explanation. Also, radiocarbon dating isn't that accurate, but still, like, 4,500 years ago and 500 years, like, you're, you're looking at, you know, possibly that the pyramid is older than we think. Um, and also, um, <laughs> he found these other objects. Uh, why were these inside here? What's this? It's like a ball? Granite ball? Uh, bronze instrument of some hook? And, uh, one, what was this one? An original casing stone from the north side. Five hundred years? Yeah, I think the, the, the number is a thousand to five hundred years before the, um, the set date of building the pyramids. That the wood was, was chopped, but they, they preserved a lot of wood in in, in Geneva. What do you think about Egyptians renovating the outside of the pyramid? Menkara's one? I hate it. I, I do not think they should do it. So that's some things he found inside there. Now, not just that, but the Queen's Chamber ones don't go to the outside. They are um, plugged with these trap doors. At the very end of both, both of these shafts in the Queen's Chamber, there are these trap doors with iron handles. And they have drilled through them and behind them only found a small empty room, but there was nothing inside. And when I say room, by the way, it's not even like a... It's like the size of me. I don't know. It's it's not a room. It's it's literally just a small extension. Uh, they did not find anything of particular interest behind both of these doors. This, however, is how the outside of the king's chamber shafts look. So here you can see actually the size of it. This guy can barely get his body like this. But this is because some people attempted to dig, at, at some point in history, down this shaft. Um, where later on, where they haven't dug, it's only the size of your hand. So they thought, you know, this could be interesting, some robbers or something, but it wasn't. And these details are likely to have been added in later times. But yeah, that, that's where the, the, the tunnels are at. So what do we think, chat? We got, we got 15 minutes left. What do you think these are? What do we think History of Ganon has seen? What do you think, if you had to guess now, before we get to know, what do you think the purpose of these shafts are? Some people have suspected that they are for communications. So like, if you're burying the pharaoh, right? And you don't want the grave to be robbed. This is a product with thousands of people building. And if everyone knows where the pharaoh is buried and where the treasures are at, what's to stop them from like 10 years later going back and robbing the thing? You know, you kind of want it to be secret. And so some people have suspected that these were for communications during building and that only the most trusted workers were allowed to build these upper parts.
and sort of the uh, the the the, um, the less trusted workers would just be hauling stones. Uh, it could be used for ropes, maybe of some kind, maybe for like pulling or I don't know, right? Could it be used for what else could it be used for? I, I think specifically that the the fact they were used for air is unlikely. I think specifically wanting air inside there was unlikely. When no one was going to be inside that room when it was closed. And they're also placed in certain areas on the the walls where they would they're they're gonna ventilate less than if they were higher up. Yeah, I don't know. We might also get to know what the well shaft is for. If he figures out the air shaft, maybe the well shaft could also be understood. It's a, risk, a risky exit. Looks like a risky fin. Okay, we gotta... We gotta stop. Uh, line firing. Thank you for the 20, by the way. Thank you for the $20. Thank you, I'm hugging for the two years. I, I've muted alerts just so I can uh, yap and waffle my way through this. No couple today today? Hell no. Hell no. We're watching, we're watching Pyramid Lore of the Decade instead of Pyramid uh, Cup of the Day. I, th there is no Cup of the Day I'd rather skip than this one. Does not matter what map it is. We are Pyramid streaming all day. <laughs> we are Pyramid streaming all day. Banana bread at work, dude? Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of shitty things in this live, dude. But banana bread at work, dude? I want a garlic video. Mm. I'm intrigued as well. His his teaser video got a million views for this. And there's like a thousand people waiting in the watch party, but I... Suggest you all also watch it yourselves. Like, at least open a tab if you can with History for Granite's video. It starts in just nine minutes. Uh, my intention with this is to share my love and passion for pyramids and my appreciation for History for Granite's channel. I do not want to, uh, to steal from his hard work. So I hope I make you guys interested. I hope you guys binge all his videos with Adblock off and, and give him some ad revenue. That would be amazing. Way ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for supporting such great creators. We need this. We do need this. Popcorn is ready. Mine too. Mine too. <laughs> I also have popcorn. Transportation shaft for smaller items. Yeah, but like, what small items would you need in there? And it's a lot of work, by the way, for 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 creating that. I think it has to do with either some some. Oh, I'm so scared to be wrong about this, but we're all wrong. I think we're all wrong. I think history for granted is one of the only people that know. Some form of communicating when when building it. Whether that's like rolling a ball down the thing or like speaking into it or something. <sighs> or... You know, there's a... Okay, there's an, there's an alternative uh, version of, of how the pyramid was built too. Which is that it was first built and then it was extended upon. So the first version of the pyramid would go to where the Queen's Chamber shafts meet the wall and then they added more to it after. Maybe this is also explained some way. What are the mention of the shafts? Uh, they all point at different angles. Uh, I think the steepest one is th this one, pointing at 41 angles up, uh, 41 degrees upward. This one is like 39, and the other two are around 36 degrees. They're all different angles. They're all different angles, and they're not as straight as they look. 
Uh, Pyramid Shaft's turns. I don't know if I can find this, but they, they, they like... They... They're... They're turning all over the place. Left and right and stuff. They're not straight lines. So I, I'm not good at finding these things. I've only seen them in videos. And so the, the, the fact that they're turning and stuff makes it unlikely that, you know, they would be designed to be pointed at stars specifically. In my opinion. And if you make an opening like this, it's almost always going to point at a star regardless. I don't think that's the intended purpose. Maybe search side view? Detailed map of King's Chamber Shafts Pyramid 3D. Uh, everyone draws them as straight lines. I, I can assure you that they're not. But every, every interpretation I see is just a straight line. Detailed view of the king shaft? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's for science, guys. I'm googling for science here, okay? <laughs> I'm doing the scientific process. We got five minutes. I know, we got five minutes. Let's, uh, let's open the video. Virgil's very passionate about the pyramids? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. We got about a thousand viewers ready to watch this on the de debut. <laughs> Mom, I swear it's a Trigmania stream. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. This is the Queen Chamber one. It's marked 1872. That was that was when it was opened. I think this is the... I don't know what this is. This top one. Link it. I already did, but I can link it again. Uh, please do uh, watch it live as well. And subscribe to this channel and like the video. But how would they move all the stones from the quarry? It's super far. Nobody's managed to cut a stone big with the tools they had. They've tried. Uh, the cutting of the stones is another mystery. Uh, I think some of it is quite well understood, but... There's a lot of, um... Questions about the time it took them. To, uh, to build the pyramids. If you have to build it in, in 30 years for a pharaoh, and... You have to cut and place and lift like 2 million stones, it's gonna take a while. Um, yeah. But this is about the shafts. Today we're talking about shafts, chat. Whew. Do we know why the king's chamber is off-center? Uh, we do not. But interestingly, the exact middle between north and south in the pyramid is a stone called the Great Step. And it's located directly above, at the top of the Grand Gallery. Like, the last part of the Grand Gallery is the perfect middle of the pyramid, north-south. And this stone originally had, like, um, a valley sort of thing. It, it was very clearly, like, angled down in the middle and flat on the sides, and then it went down in the middle. Uh, which made it look like it had been used for, like, a rope and pulling things up the Grand Gallery. Uh, but when Egypt restored this for tourism, they just placed a bunch of concrete there to make it more walkable for tourists. Thinking that, oh, it was just some loose rock. Forehead, some rocks have fallen off here. This is just clearly, let's just restore this to a state that it was never at. And if it's found out to be used for, for you know, actual like, um, building the pyramid, then they just grief their own monument really hard. So that's another thing. It's like, the great step is potentially just a part of the pyramid that Egypt griefed themselves. Because it looked way different a hundred years ago. She on my pyramid till I shaft. Stop. This is a holy place. This is a... We're, we're watching one of the world's 
oldest standing monuments from the ancient world. One of the greatest monuments on planet Earth. We do not do that here, Eraser. Top of the day, no. Uh, for everyone watching for Trickmania, this is a pyramid only stream today. We have more important matters than uh, playing one cup of the day. Today we are talking about the pyramids. Tomorrow, cup of the day. How's my cold? Uh, worse today, but I took some painkillers because I gotta be here. I gotta be present for this. So I took some painkillers and now we're... <laughs> <laughs> We're watching. <laughs> and I won't probably stream too long today, guys, but I just wanna... He's saying, here we go. He's saying, here we go. In the chat. So excited. Yeah, guys, one last mention. Do go check out the video. It's starting now. There's about 2,000 people watching it live. There could be more. Please go check out History for Granite. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. What has he found? What has History for Granite found in these shafts? How has he done this research? Is someone chatting on the virtual TV? Oh no, that's me, that's me, that's me. Don't worry about it. Unless... Oh, no. <laughs> I think this is Buckley. <laughs> Someone else is using the virtual TV account. Any good new lore? It's starting right now. It's starting right now. It's starting right now, guys. He's saying Joel, Joel, Joel. A drunk Scandinavian man sent me here. <laughs> I wonder who that could be. Okay. Let's see it. It's hit seven. You can see the description. Okay, we got two minutes. Two minutes, okay, so... Wait, it's playing audio from mul multiple places? I'm confused. Where's the audio coming from? Oh. Okay, okay. Okay. So, it's starting in one a minute, 22 seconds. The Great Pyramid contains four mysterious small shafts within its superstructure. These channels connect the King's Chamber to the Pyramid's exterior, yet never fully connected the Queen's Chamber to the outside. This is what we looked at. The Queen's Chamber shafts do not go to the outside. You can see it here. These lines, they do not go to the outside. Okay. No other Egyptian pyramid has such channels, and yet they have confounded explorers for thousands of years. This video looks at the full history of the channels, scrutinizes the most popular theories for their purpose, and reveals new evidence to finally bring a solution. But like every great discovery, the answer to this mystery brings it with even more interesting questions. Oh boy, get the popcorn ready everybody. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna bump the audio. Popcorn is such a cute emote. 10 seconds. Four, three, two, one. Welcome. To history for granted. Subscribe Join me right to now. Explore ancient right Egypt. now, chat. Please subscribe, and together we'll uncover secrets from the past written in stone. 
If I had to pick the most emblematic feature of the Great Pyramid, it would have to be the small channels that emanate from the upper chambers in the structure. This is ironic, because they are far from the most impressive feature of the pyramid. They can't hold a candle to the soaring Grand Gallery, or a magnificent King's Chamber with its flat granite ceiling. But despite their modest size and supplementary role, there is something about the channels which captures the imagination. What are they, they for? uniquely force the mind to travel through the mass of stone and envision everything that might be hidden out of sight. A tantalizing hint that something only the size of your hand, so you can never go inside to be them. discovered inside the pyramid. These small channels have been taunting explorers for millennia. The scars on the pyramid where they enter and exit the structure bear witness to past efforts to uncover their secrets. But despite many attempts, both modern and ancient, to decipher their meaning, there has been no discovery to decisively determine a solution. But now, that's all going to change. In this video, we're going to scrutinize the most popular theories for the channel. This is a very popular new theory. Evidence to determine that their it looks original up the stars. Purpose. As difficult as that sounds, the clues have always been there, waiting to be found. The history of exploration <laughs> in the channels is a long tale of curiosity and innovation worthy of its own video, but I will give a brief summary here. The channels which travel from the King's Chamber have been noted in descriptions of the Great Pyramid since Abdal Latif al-Baghdadi in 1200 AD. He writes, quote, in the upper part, openings and windows which seemed to have been made to give passage to air and light. End quote. The earliest detailed description of the channels come from John Greaves in 1646. In his book, Pyramidographia, he gives accurate measurements and describes them as they are seen today. Notably, Greaves' account of the southern channel mentions its presently rounded shape and larger size, thus revealing the damage to it predates written records. Greaves also notes the southern channel was blackened with soot, presumably from the burning I of lamps I didn't know this one was that damaged. In 1818, Captain Giovanni Caviglia took a great interest in the channels, believing they would lead towards hidden chambers. The southern channel's damage could have been made for a person to crawl in and inspect where it leads, but the northern channel's sharp lateral bend made similar so inspection turning. impossible. They're not straight Thus, lines. Cavilia dug a tunnel from the portcullis antechamber towards the northern channel, then followed its bend westward. The excavation ends as the channel straightens northward again, 12 meters deep into the pyramid from the king's chamber. Later, in 1837, it is from this vantage point that Howard Weiss observed one could see at least 35 feet without any opening or apartment. This explains why Cavilia's tunnel ended there, because it was grueling work with less than six inches of progress per day. Yeah. During Weiss's expedition in 1837, he hired civil engineer John Shea Pering. Pering was the first recorded person to spot the exit point of the King's Chamber Northern Channel. It opens 79 meters high up on the pyramid's northern face. So steep. This Look exit how steep point for the northern channel was discovered extremely damaged, as it had been excavated about 11 meters downward, just large enough for a small person to squeeze through. The northern channel was very plugged with sand and stones, and Howard Weiss's men spent many days slowly clearing it with boring rods. The southern channel exit point was soon discovered afterwards, and it too was cleared of debris. On May 29, 1837, upon clearing the southern channel, Vice writes, quote, Upon the removal of this block, the channel was completely open, an immediate rush of air took place, and we had the satisfaction of finding that the ventilation of the king's chamber was perfectly restored, and that the air within it was cool and fresh. End quote. At this time, the mystery of the channels was considered solved, their purpose was for ventilation, and the Great Pyramid was finally given reprieve from the violent explorations that were undertaken to find this solution. Thirty-five years later, however, the mystery was complicated by a discovery made by Wayman Dixon and James Grant. Upon observing curious cracks in the southern wall of the Queen's Chamber, Dixon probed a nearby joint with a wire to what he described as an unconscionable length. <laughs> this spot was then excavated to reveal a channel in the south wall, and from there it was easily inferred that another channel was also present in the north wall. An article in the publication Nature on December 26, 1872 There's documented the wood piece. this discovery. 
The article also contextualizes the, the enigma of this discovery, stating, quote, the discovery of these channels, which may be called Dixon's channels, in no way tends as yet to solve the enigma of the Queen's Chamber, but rather to increase the difficulties of the solution. End quote. Upon their opening, the Queen's Chamber channels revealed three artifacts left since the construction of the Great Pyramid. A small dollarite ball, an even smaller copper hook, and a short length of cedar wood. Known as the Dixon relics, they were all at various times lost within museums. Fortunately, today they are all accounted for. It was initially assumed the Queen's Chamber channels would also penetrate to the exterior of the pyramid, but later explorers searched for them, only to come up empty-handed. In 1882, Flinders Petrie took detailed measurements of the channels using a goniometer, and even looked down them with a telescope when the angle of the sun was ideal. He was interested in using the channels as a reference point for analyzing the original angle of the pyramid casing stones. Huh. But as previously noted by Weiss and Pering, the channels all have some bend or twist to them. After extensive analysis, Petrie was left to conclude, quote, With regard to the main part of these air channels, it is disappointing that they vary so much in azimuth and altitude that they are useless for connecting the measures of the inside and outside <laughs> But of it's the like, pyramid. why are they turning so End much? Quote. Further investigation of the Queen's That's Chamber channels would not occur until 1928, when Morton Edgar undertook the task of determining their lengths. Using an ingenious system of steel rods attached with flexible joints, he was able to measure the southern channel to its blocking stone. The length was measured at 63.4 meters. The rods used a ball at their tips so as not to become stuck on any joints or small obstructions. The Queen's Chamber Northern Channel proved much more difficult to measure on account of the sharp lateral bend it makes. Edgar was able to probe 53.3 meters up before his rods broke. He made a second attempt with new rods, but they also broke at the same distance. Edgar writes, quote, So, if any later investigator examines the north air channel of the Queen's Chamber, he will find two long lengths of steel <laughs> rods with Oops. steel screw couplers and an oval ball of hard wood <laughs> Sorry guys, drop my uh, steel he also rods adds, 53 quote, meters deep. <laughs> I had at least proved beyond a doubt that the channels are by yeah, no means so that. short as many, including Reisner <laughs> and his German friend, had theorized. End quote. The person Edgar is referring to is Professor George Reisner of Harvard University, one of the most important Egyptologists the of the 20th century. The walls. Reisner believes so the Queen's Chamber channels were only dummy original air channels, or from, and that they did not extend um, more than a few rods. feet upwards into the pyramid. Reisner's incorrect assumption about the Queen's Chamber channels was an early example of the controversy Egyptology faced about their purpose. It also was part of a troubling trend where researchers simply invent parameters for the channels required to fit their theory. This still occurs with present Egyptologists. John Romer's 2007 book on the Great Pyramid claims of the Queen's Chamber channels, quote, Despite claims that the ends of these two hidden shafts were never left uncut at their point to the entrance of the chamber, practicalities of stone cutting make it more likely that the two square holes were closed with two well-made flickstein, which had been rendered invisible by the copious deposits of soot and salt. End quote. There is still a piece of means. the uncut northern channel in place, which proves Romer is incorrect and not serious about investigating this mystery. In ah, addition to measuring the channel, Morton of Edgar originally. undertook the task of unplugging the King's Chamber northern channel, which had become clogged again since Vice and Pering cleared it almost a century prior. Upon completion of the job, Edgar writes, quote, as the result of these two channels being open, the temperature in the interior of the pyramid immediately decreased, making the inside of the building very much more comfortable to work in, and more comfortable for the numerous visitors too, for it used to be very hot in the pyramid." End quote. Edgar goes on to build some masonry at the outer ends of the King's Chamber channels to prevent them from being plugged uh, up so again. He's the reason Here is a rare of picture that. of the southern channel taken by Edgar before he began construction. Yeah, that's, he's Edgar the one reported that, this yeah. job was successful 10 years later when he visited in 1938, noting that both channels remained entirely There's no clear. way it was just but air conditioning. But as the 20th well. century progressed, that is history insane. was they not were, they were kind to the hard work done on the channels by Vice, Pering, Petrie, and Edgar. 
Much of their research on the channels was forgotten or ignored, and later it's writers would just claim the channels were perfectly straight and draw conclusions from their various angles of inclination. A theory that became quite popular was the star alignment theory, that each channel is pointed towards a particular star in the night sky, which was revered by the ancient Egyptians. But none of the channels are remotely straight. This is what I mean. And their the inclinations terms. also change they don't by point a few the stars. degrees, it makes no sense. depending upon where you measure. Furthermore, the exit points of the King's Chamber channels are now I lost, don't think it's that so either. the most important reference points for star alignments are entirely missing. An argument for precise alignment can be thrown out immediately, and so when evaluating this option, I will consider a more generic version which allows for loosely aligned channels. A major flaw is the northern channel is considered a simulacra of the northern entrance passage that exists in every other Old Kingdom pyramid. Those entrances are always constructed extremely straight, in contrast to the northern channels of the Great Pyramid, which have the most bend. This discrepancy is mm. never explained, and it's important to note that constructing every other entrance perfectly straight was much more difficult than building the small channels of the Great Pyramid. If the builders wanted the channels straight, they would have been built straight. But the earlier explanation of ventilation was thrown into turmoil by the discovery of the Queen's Chamber channels. They never penetrated to the yeah. chamber or the outside of the pyramid, so how could ventilation be their purpose? Thus, a spiritual explanation was the best that could be established. Here is Egyptologist Zahi Hawass explaining Kill his Sir. version. My theory that I believe that the south shaft functioned, uh, it's a symbolic corridor yes. for the soul of the king as the sun god Ra. The northern one, it's also a model corridor for the king as the god Horus okay. to join the northern stars. Egyptologist Mark Lehner concedes there is some uncertainty, but strongly so was, asserts if you a don't know, it's like the, the, the high probability they are evil not boss channels of to Egyptology. Air in here. They are channels for the king's soul to come out of in his sarcophagus through the northern channel up to the northern sky. But there's basically all these the spiritual explanations, stars. right? I can see why this explanation appeals to anyone presenting and I'm as I'm guessing an it has a more practical topic. purpose. It makes it sound like I think what, really earned your what History for Granted is going to present is that it's more practical. There, the there is an actual reason. Which a layperson could not appreciate. This soul channel theory became widely popular in Egypt. Because just saying it's religious is like a, such as Rainier a cop out. And I. We don't know, Edwards so it must be a religious thing. Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass. Pyramid texts from centuries later were also cited in support of stellar connections. Examples include Pyramid Text 821, which says the king ascends and descends with the constellation Orion in the eastern sky. Also, Pyramid Text 882. Just, this is the only is pyramid that has these. Sirius, so has every other pharaoh would not Orion. rise to the, While the, the stars this way. Explanation for channels was it would gaining be just a one time only acceptance, thing. The Great Pyramid was experiencing a growing problem. The trapped heat and moisture perspiring from tourists made the interior unpleasant and caused damage to its surfaces. To solve this, Zahi Hawass hired German engineer Rudolf Gantenbrink to construct a robot which could once again clear the King's Chamber channels and install an electrified ventilation system. Gantenbrink wasn't interested in ventilation, he wanted to explore the Queen's Chamber channels <laughs> and observe their termination points. Consequently, he completed the King's Chamber air conditioning work as a requirement to explore the unseen. He's like, Queen's yeah, I can do this for channels. you, but I'm really only here for exploring the shaft, man. Like, system I don't care. reduced the Great Pyramid's humidity from 79% to an atmospheric 53% within a day. This was accomplished by blowing air at only 30% of the system capacity. The following year, Gantenbrink's robot finally reached the end of the Queen's Chamber Southern Channel to observe copper pins inserted within a blocking yeah, stone door about 15 meters shy stone. of where it could have exited the pyramid. The discovery of copper pins within the Great Pyramid was met with excitement, and Egyptologists such as Mark Lehner hailed it as a significant find. The fact that there's a blocking stone with two mysterious copper pins on the south, and then in the shaft going from the north, there's another blocking stone with two mysterious copper pins, makes it all the more an act of meaning on the part of the pyramid builders.
Hawass would go on to describe the blocking stones with copper pins as miniature doors, but Lehner did not agree with that assessment. In his book, The Complete Pyramids, Lehner writes, quote, The find was labeled a door, though in fact nothing larger than a small rat could get through it, so perhaps <laughs> slab is a better description. It's re- like, End this quote. is a robot, keep in mind, Two this is not later, like a human in crawl, a book Hawass a and Lehner co-authored, tiny, tiny. they still maintain the importance of the copper pins, writing, quote, It seems almost unavoidable that the blocking slabs and copper pins carried a ritual function, possibly related to the bolts of the sky spoken of in the later pyramid texts. We don't know, so it has to be religious. Now, these two gentlemen know more about the spiritual beliefs of ancient Egyptians than I do, but I find their logic a bit strained. This is such Every an academic way of roasting someone. It's hilarious. Passage, taking the pharaoh to the stars, but in the Great Pyramid, a rat-sized passage is used instead? Using Mark Lehner's example of a rat, how does he think Khufu envisioned this journey? Lacking any frame of reference for the copper pins, their purpose is pure speculation. They seem important to us in the present day because they're a rare, unspoiled piece of the monument. But for the ancient Egyptians, they might be the equivalent of some rusty nails left out of sight in a construction project. Notably, the copper pins are bent into rounded handles on the outer faces of the stones. Thus, any interaction with these pins would come from looking down the channels rather than up them. As the pyramid was constructed, every channel would need to be sealed intermittently to prevent rain and sand from clogging it up. The copper pin blocking stones we see today are perfectly suitable for that task. The floor and ceiling stones of the Uh. channels have separated joints, and so the protruding floor could hold a blocking slab in place with gravity until the next ceiling stone was ready. In the King's Uh. Chamber Southern Channel, there are two anomalous niches cut into the walls, which would also facilitate a similar-sized blocking stone. The Queen's Chamber channels may simply be unfinished, and the copper pin blocking stones left in place after the channels were abandoned. It's possible the copper hook and handle were part of a tool used to pry the blocking slabs loose if they were temporarily plastered during construction, but they could be totally unrelated items as well. It's important to clarify that labeling any part of a pyramid as unfinished is difficult to prove because the craftsmanship within them varies substantially. The Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber is the only space within any Old Kingdom pyramid that can be called yeah. unfinished without controversy. Assessing if the Queen's Chamber channels were unfinished requires an evaluation of the Queen's Chamber itself, and so let's take a closer look. There are four main characteristics of the Queen's Chamber to support the idea it was never finished, and I will list them from weakest to strongest. The first is that older accounts claim its walls were rough and unpolished. But as Flinders Petrie observed, there was a large amount of crystalline salt growth in the chamber which would create this appearance. With the salt removed, the quality of the finish is quite standard. We can strike this one as evidence completely. The second is the openings of the channels themselves remaining sealed. For a period after their discovery, this was a common assumption, that they were unused channels due to their concealment. But it would be circular reasoning to use them as evidence for the Queen's Chamber being unfinished if our purpose is to evaluate the channels. So, we can't okay, count this too one. Fast for me. The third is the condition of the chamber I didn't floor understand that. and the floor of the passage leading to it. The entire surface of both chamber and passage are rough core masonry. Finnish chambers have smooth, fine quality pavement, yes. which is not present in the Queen's Chamber. Yeah, the Queen's Chamber An is An excuse rough. put forth is that the floor must have been and entirely ripped up by treasure hunters, but this is an extremely weak argument. Other pyramid chambers with dugout floors have some bits left at the edges. Even the single example of the Red Pyramid's entirely missing floor shows obvious traces of where it once existed. The problem is complicated by the Queen's Chamber subfloor showing signs of having been built upon, but not in a manner for setting finished pavement. The subfloor has been cut down in the center of the room, with a consistent 75-centimeter gap between the cuttings and the walls. Egyptian builders always cut down a lower block to fit one that would be set atop it. Observing this in the Queen's Chamber, Petrie writes, quote, These sunken edges are well seen in other parts of the core masonry, and their meaning here is unequivocal. Petrie is thus left to conclude of the floor, quote, It has been built over with similar rough masonry, which was afterwards stripped down to insert the chamber walls. 
End quotes. Additionally, it does not make sense why looters would strip mm. the entire horizontal passage okay. of thin pavement without further excavation. The missing floor of the queen's chamber and passage are thus probable evidence of an unfinished probable, space. Probable, but his last thing, okay. Finally, the western corner of the queen's chamber threshold has a projection of extra stone which was never dressed smooth. Of this projection, Petrie writes, quote, It is really a surplus left on both sides of the corner in order to protect the stone in transit and in course of building. This undressed part in the chamber is cut away down to the true surface at the top and at the middle joint in this order to show is the very exactly to where like it if you look at the king's chamber everything is smooth and it off. End quote. This is 100% unfinished work. Like the king's and this chamber corner would perhaps be the last part of the queen's chamber walls to complete because it's the most fragile and vulnerable edge. Interpreting this unfinished corner gets interesting because the physical evidence is incontrovertible. As Petrie points out, even the unfinished part has been meticulously crafted with a reference line in the middle joint so that the job could be finished as quickly <laughs> and easily as possible. Yeah, it has to join. This is not comparable to other undressed stones where the finish is haphazardly incomplete. Accidentally leaving the edge rough is highly suspicious because of the minimal effort necessary to complete it. An hour of one worker's time is nothing compared to the Great Pyramid as a whole. I should also add that the Queen's Chamber Passage was designed so that it would be blocked off, and this is not comparable to this any other fascinating. pyramid. fascinating. It's an important anomaly which lacks explanation. Interpreting the Queen's Chamber and its channels as incomplete would support a ventilation theory for the king's chamber channels, and so let's discuss that idea in detail. A common argument against ventilation is that the channels are not optimized for airflow based upon yes. their design. This is an extremely weak argument because the channels do conduct air quite efficiently, as proven three separate times that they were unplugged in the modern era. It's often suggested the channels would be more efficient if they were entirely horizontal, they but this would, is think. incorrect. It's not. The aperture of the channels, <laughs> combined with the shortness of their length, are the most important variables for air to push through They're a shorter relatively shorter because of the diagonal. Conduit. By angling the channels upward, the Egyptians gave them the shortest path to the edge of they, the pyramid. Yeah, they are shorter. This is also the simplest explanation for their varying angles of Wait. inclination. The queen's chamber channels are within one degree of each other, but the king's chamber northern channel is 12 degrees less than its counterpart on the south. The king's chamber is off-center from the pyramid's axis, and thus the difference in inclination still follows the shortest path to the pyramid's edge for both channels. It's true that the lateral bends both northern channels take would slightly reduce airflow, but this seems a minor complaint compared to sending the pharaoh's soul on a dog-leg journey to the circumpolar <laughs> stars. Finally, the location <laughs> okay, of the fair. channels in the pyramid chambers seems perfectly adequate for this purpose of ventilation. Placing them near the ceiling would greatly complicate the roofing process and make them even more vulnerable to the lateral thrust yeah. of the saddle vaults. The lowest joints in the queen's chamber channels are constructed differently to perhaps resist some of the extra lateral force in that location. The Egyptians may also have simply preferred to have the channels at a height where they could set a lamp or inspect for intrusive debris. A study by Gunther Muge calculated an air transport of 75 to 118 cubic meters per hour through the channels for the king's chamber, and so a design for ventilation was perfectly adequate. It's also important to investigate the architecture of the channel blocks to determine what the Egyptians were intending for their purpose. Except where the channels bend or open, they consist of two stones fitted together the same way. I think we'll the walls and ceiling are made from a single stone. Let the video play and go through it after, because I don't want to interrupt him. This upside down U is set on top a of lot. a flat stone, which makes up the floor. It's a great design because three out of four surfaces are made of the same block and thus prevent settlement or falling out of alignment. We still see some lateral movement of the joints in a few locations, but the more serious vertical pressure has been mitigated. The channels are a novel pyramid feature, but what might have inspired this design? Mm -hmm. At Giza and other pyramid complexes, you will find very similar U-shaped stones used to channel water away from buildings. A natural line of thinking might be to invert the blocks and use them to channel air instead of water. As above, so below, I believe someone once said. 
But if you're holding firm on a rat-sized channel for the soul, perhaps a sewer drain could be considered as a similar inspiration. The channels have proven effective for climate control within the pyramid, however there is a very big problem with this explanation. There is no established reason why a burial chamber within a pyramid would require yeah, ventilation in the why first place. Why would you need it the in Great the burial chamber? The Great Pyramid is unique in that its entrance is below the chambers within it, and this does cause a buildup of smoke, heat, and condensation that does not quickly dissipate. Groups of people with heat-emitting lamps make it uncomfortable, as seen by Zahi Hawass <laughs> perspiring within them on live TV. But the workers of ancient Egypt endured worse environments than the king and queen's chambers. I mean, you're working in there the with well torches, subterranean chamber, and the miles of tunnels underneath Djoser's pyramid. Yeah, you're working in there with torches. Furthermore, most of then. the work on the king and queen's chambers would be complete before they were roofed over with restricted airflow. It is this lack of explanation for why the Great Pyramid would require ventilation that makes it an unsuitable answer for many researchers. One more way to evaluate the importance of stonework to ancient Egyptians is to look at how finely finished the stones are. This method was pioneered by Flinders Petrie, and it remains one of the best tools we have for consideration. The robots of the past few decades have given us a good look inside the channels, and the workmanship is highly irregular, as if they weren't very important. Mm -hmm. If an empty channel for a king's soul was necessary, why should the soul be chafed, tripped, nudged, <laughs> squeezed, and twisted yeah. on its way through? It In addition to channels for air or souls, other ideas have been presented, but they venture into even greater speculation. They were so channels for communication like they were so is one idea, detailed and everything. but this seems even less necessary At least than the visible air. Things. Channels for magical waters to flow into the pyramid are another spin on a spiritual interpretation. The essence of the enigma rests upon whether the channels were open or closed. Closed channels wouldn't have a utilitarian purpose, and open channels wouldn't have a spiritual one. If we can determine which was the case, we can break open the stalemate of have which the explanation is the likely candidate. The pyramids of Egypt I are so far removed from the present that any design choice can seem mysterious. The best analytical method for me has been comparing them in sequence for a greater context. But the Great Pyramid channels stand alone. There is no pyramid to compare them to. Yeah. We are very lucky, however, that there are four separate channels, each with its own characteristics, that can be compared to each other. And this will be just enough to get us the answer we so greatly desire. Okay, wait, here we go. Ready? Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> and here we Let's see go. it. Let's see it. First, we okay. return to 1837, when John Shea Pering was clearing out the King's Chamber we Southern Channel after having unplugged the Northern one. The Northern Channel is the longest and least inclined channel, which made unplugging it an enormous challenge. Pering was expecting a similar challenge at the South, and thus had J.R. Hill blast the pyramid around the channel to make a working platform for heavy equipment. Oh In preparation for this work, Pering or Hill decided that it was necessary to remove the highest remaining block that comprised part of the southern channel. It's never explicitly written that they removed this block, but it disappeared after their job, and it's the most likely explanation. But Pering leaves us documentation of this missing block, understanding that its removal will forever destroy a piece of evidence that was minor for him, but major for us. He draws a sketch of the block from two angles and writes, quote, It curved downward horizontally, as shown by the dotted lines, probably with the view of preventing the sand from choking it up. End quote. In 1837, after flat. having cleared the northern channel, it was taken for granted that the channels were for conducting air. But John Pering was the most talented researcher to ever document the pyramids, and he always went above and beyond with details. I don't know how else to explain it, but if you were to make a tier <laughs> ranking of pyramid researchers, Pering would be the only S tier. Yeah, there is no higher Pering, standard for high a testimony tier. in this line of work. Unfortunately, Pering's drawing isn't quite as detailed as his description. He describes the channel curving downward, but in his drawing, only a vertical joint is the certain. Only S -tier this slight ambiguity researcher. has led countless researchers afterwards to entirely ignore Pering's analysis. 
Everyone who wanted an elegant channel pointed toward the sky just assumes it. pairing was wrong, and nobody has ever had the guts oh. to explain why. Researchers Maragioglio and Rinaldi so a even agree that ventilation end. is a likely purpose for the channels, but they draw the southern that one continuing up despite replicating the vertical joint drawn by pairing. But pairing doesn't just draw the joint, he describes the channel as curving downward. And while even Pairing has made mistakes, he got a very, very good look at this block. In the modern day, we know that channels don't have vertical joints, except where they change angles, but Pairing couldn't have known this was the case, even if he suspected it. There is one anomalous vertical joint in the four channels, and thus we can never be 100% certain that Pairing's analysis was correct. However, if you're being honest about the probability of this scenario, it's much more likely that Pairing got it right, and that there were details other than the vertical joint that we can't see in the drawing. Academic Egyptology has not always accepted Pairing's work as part of its canon because he predates the discipline. Egyptologist Muhammad Ismail Khaled recently excavated Sahure's pyramid, and he was the first researcher since Pairing to do so. In many articles about the findings, Khaled explains that Pering's observations at Sahure were correct. However, the rules of the trade required Khaled to follow Egyptologist Ludwig Borchardt's plan of the pyramid, which was far less detailed. Here is an excerpt mm. from an online presentation Khaled gave on the topic. The great Ludwig Borchardt came with his nicely perfect plan for the, uh, for the pyramid, so everyone followed his plans, but he did not excavate. I made this mistake and I followed his plan. Of course, I have to, because it's the well accepted one. We started. <laughs> but then he goes to the even course, older plan and it's more accurate. With That's interesting. Orchard plans. I couldn't work because this was the most accepted one. If I, uh, I go back to, uh, to John Beering, no one will believe me because I'm not following the proper one. I must say Khaled deserves great respect for his candor on John Pering, in addition to his new discoveries at the Pyramid of Sahure. Since Pering was the last and only witness to the southern channel curving to horizontal, many Egyptologists have pretended it never happened because none of them ever documented it. As bizarre as that sounds, remember John Romer is inaccurately characterizing the Queen's Chamber channel openings where the stone still exists today. Knowing the King's Chamber channels leveled out to horizontal yeah. is extremely important it's to get everything because right. it's strong evidence the channels opened all the way through the casing stones. The reasons the builders would oh. make this decision is obvious, and it rebukes many criticisms of the ventilation theory. It would go all the way Objections to casing stones. Objections to open air channels for the Great Pyramid include that it would allow the intrusion of rainwater, wind blown sand, and bats. But it doesn't take a modern-day engineering degree to figure out how to put a protective cover over an open hole. With a horizontal channel opening, even a small projection of stone above it would eliminate all rainwater intrusion. But would you want if wind-blown sand was a concern, so the channel that you could dip down to eliminate that as well. And there has never been any documentation of bats entering or roosting in the channels from the explorers who examined them. Bats much prefer to fly than to crawl, and not even the most adventurous bat will crawl over 50 meters through a rat-sized hole. And near the 100th course of the Great Pyramid, no other critter would be looking for a dark hole to enter. Lastly, huh. if there was an unforeseen issue, the Egyptians could have climbed the pyramid to seal or unseal the channels as necessary. Not a fun job, but certainly a solvable problem. Next, we need to examine the Queen's Chamber channels where they never opened to the chamber itself. The southern channel was excavated from the top of a stone forming the wall, and then roofed with a wall block on top of it. It's a square shape about 21 by 21 centimeters, and less than 10 centimeters of the wall was left in place by to leave it closed off. After Dixon discovered this south channel, he looked to the north wall and chose the most likely location for a corresponding one. In doing so, he guessed the channel would be at the top corner of this block because wall joints would be a natural spot to put a channel. But Dixon guessed wrong, or at least slightly wrong. He excavated too far to the east because the channel is actually cut into the corners of two wall blocks. 
The smaller section of the western block is the barrier which Dixon left intact. Someone has carved a line into the wall about where the channel would open, huh. but it's not a real joint. The original joints overlaying the channel are here. The remaining that blockage of this channel, combined with the mistaken excavation, creates the illusion that the northern channel was made from a single corner. Many photographs, including the earliest ones, make it very difficult to see the true channel location. So easy is this mistake to make that I've never seen the channel's location drawn correctly in books and papers. This detail is important because it raises the question, why didn't the builders just chisel out the corner of one block to save the work of dressing a wall in the channel? The channels turn and drift and show no precise workmanship as they rise in the pyramid. But here, at the Queen's Chamber, the channels needed to be in an exact location. This reveals that the channels are aligned to one thing and one thing only. They are aligned to each other inside the chambers. The pyramid is a monument to symmetry where it can be seen, but out of sight, the channels needed no precise craftsmanship. Yeah. The logical conclusion is that the Queen's Chamber channels are aligned to each other because they were meant to be seen, yet remained unfinished like the chamber they intersect. The King's Chamber channels appear rectangular like the room they inhabit, but after they rise up, the dimensions change to a square huh. similar to the Queen's Chamber channel size. The design of the channels where they open in a chamber was clearly a point of consideration for the builders. But all this evidence is still contextual, and maybe not enough to put the matter to rest. We need something strong that we can see with our own eyes to remove the nagging doubt that 45 centuries of time will provoke. We live in an era in which amazing technologies have revealed many secrets of the pyramids. But it won't be lasers, or drones, or muography, or lidar, or microgravimetry, or photogrammetry, or robots to bring us this final clue. It can only be that oldest form of archaeology, <laughs> the kind pioneered by Vice, Caring, and Petrie, which will reveal the solution. In a monument the size of the Great Pyramid, knowing what to look for is by far the hardest part. Here, at the opening of the King's Chamber Northern Channel, is where we must search. When looking for clues in a place like this, you don't really expect to find anything. I can't explain the impulse to do it, other than an optimism that any problem can be solved with the right mindset. You try to clear your head of assumptions and just take in the stones as you see them. Beneath the garbage and the dust, the construction of the, the channel The way he does this so fascinating, I'll explain it after. The eastern block was clearly sawed in the upper wall, but beneath it, the rounded edge of a tubular drill formed the bottom corner. In contrast, the western wall is less smooth, but the bottom corner was perfectly squared by a saw cut in its half of the floor. This fact by itself is interesting. It shows the builders worked the two stones differently, based upon their tools and constraints at the time. You can even see on the wall where the saw marks change, perhaps due to the block being cut yeah. in multiple stages. Just when you think there's nothing more to see, a detail emerges in the western corner <sighs> on the floor. The sharp line of the saw cut ends. It is replaced with the rounded corner of a tubular drill in the first 25 centimeters of the channel. The channel opening, however, does not have a rounded corner. The first centimeter or two of the channel's western corner was also squared with a straight cut. This right here is the miracle the Great Pyramid left for us to see. I'll preface with the disclaimer that deciphering tool marks on stone can devolve into reading tea leaves, but here we've got a very strong signal. Why would the builders use an entirely different method of cutting for the opening to the northern channel? The answer you've already arrived at is the openings were originally sealed in the chamber and then cut open at a final stage of construction. The exact way this occurred is not clear. And there are some straight saw cuts on the floor, which extend Wait, they next built to it the sealed and then opened The it? builders may have opted to leave the channel partially cut in order to give themselves a reference line and save some work later. But what's truly remarkable is that the inner saw cut on the western floor 
does not overlap the tube drill at all. It also cuts deeper into the wall than the tube drill. Anyone who has ever cut with a straight what? saw knows that inertia would cause it to overlap if the tube drill section had been cut first. We can thus get an unmistakable sequence of cuts in the western corner of the channel. Cut one, cut two, cut three. The third and final straight cut is very interesting because it shows the builders wanted a nicely squared channel opening without rounded corners at the bottom. Unfortunately, the eastern side is too damaged to see this effect, but it also likely received a sharpened corner. Even with this clear evidence, I still wanted more. You can never be too sure when studying something as old as the Great Pyramid. I don't understand. So when traveling to Egypt last Fully. year, I made a point of taking my time and getting the lighting just right to inspect the eastern wall. Amazingly, the polish on the wall changes at the same point where the tube drill ends. Oh. And the tube drilling in the eastern corner appears smaller before the point where the saw cut begins on the western floor. Perhaps a slightly smaller tubular drill was used for the final cut. Every surface of the blocks forming the bottom of this channel appear as though it was originally sealed off. We now have a direct comparison for the channels in so the King's both Chamber were sealed. and Queen's Chamber. Finished. Unfinished. The reason for leaving the channel sealed up until the final stage may be and due to what Petrie them. observed at the Queen's Chamber floor. The chambers were filled with masonry and sand to safely get the ceilings in place, and then emptied once the heavy construction was complete. The channels were kept sealed so they wouldn't be clogged or damaged during construction. We now have a complete picture of the channels, and can be confident their purpose was for ventilation because they were opened at a final stage. While the air channel solution is an old one, let me quickly reassure you to not be huh. disappointed with this outcome. The nature of my discovery is not really the purpose for the channels. The credit for that still goes to Vice, Hill, and Pering, who risked their lives and successfully restored ventilation to the Great Pyramid in 1837. I mean, yes, but the he is not of giving this himself enough credit. <laughs> is not that the channels were for air, but who the air is for not the workers. For as many people have intuitively guessed, in ancient Egypt, workers were not given the privilege of fresh air. Nor would a monument with the scale and grandeur of the Great Pyramid be constructed to accommodate workers in such a manner. And as we now know, the ventilation for the Great Pyramid was not available until the construction of the chambers was nearly Yeah, like this complete. would be one of the last things you did. This is the best type of discovery the kind that brings with it new questions and fascinating places for the mind to go. No longer must we struggle to see how the channels burrow through the pyramid. Instead, we get to follow the channels towards a greater understanding of the ancient past and the people who lived and died there. I if have you ever so doubt many the merits questions. of your own curiosity, dear viewers, I want you to remember one thing about this video. Remember that since 1872, Every person who has entered the Great Pyramid, stared down this channel, and wondered what it all meant, has had the most important clue, quite <laughs> literally, under their nose. It's a great reminder I mean, that the work is never finished, and that the world is full of wonder for those who might seek it out. At the oh, Great the Pyramid, music. the research has barely gotten started. Wow, the search okay. isn't just for answers, okay, wow. it's for better questions. Wow, wow, I've wow. waited a long time to share this discovery, but in the next video coming soon, you will get answers to the new questions that have been brought. Then at last, the next chapter for the Pyramids of There's Egypt more. can truly begin. There's still Thanks more. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Guys, please YouTube subscribe and to the Twitch channel chat. to see more of this content. I want to talk Take about like this video. I didn't want to fit. interrupt him. And above all, remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granted. Okay. I mean, that is so cool. I think everyone right now, if you found this interesting, subscribe to History for Granite, like this video, watch a couple other pyramid videos. Um, Because he is going to post more stuff too about these. Okay. Uh, we got to talk about this. So, I didn't want to interrupt him too much. Uh, it's like a 45-minute video. Wow, that, that passed by quickly. But...
A uh, couple of things I found interesting. The, the channels... Like, even if you... Okay. Even if you make them the shortest possible for air conditioning, right? You'd still... I imagine you'd, you'd still try to dig a straight path. Like, that's just easier than making all kinds of turns and twists. I feel like to... Like, if you dig, dig a tunnel... Just the simplest is like, let's go at a straight angle, straight to the edge, you know? So if you... Wait, this is not load? Wait. Where was the... Um, the turns? Welcome to History for Grace. Not here. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Did I miss it? Please subscribe, and together we'll uncover secrets from the... Wait. Here. Like how they turn and stuff. And sometimes they turn left and right and not just up. That was interesting to me. Um, another thing I found that wasn't touched that much upon was, was the objects. Like if this was fully sealed. And it was, and everything was fully sealed. Why? What are these for? What is the dolerite ball and the copper hook and the like the wood? Did they just drop it in there on accident? The fact that this last block was horizontal though is game changing. Did this outer block being horizontal game changer? Because it shifts the the view of the pyramids, not to the stars, but more towards the idea of like you don't want rain to come inside it's so small that humans are not going to go in there it's so high up that uh, rats are not going to go in there and it's such a long tunnel that bats are not going to fly in but the last question he posed who is the air for you're in a pyramid the pharaoh has been buried the pyramid is sealed with huge plugging blocks why were these opened It was clearly sealed later. You know, it could be that, I mean, there could be there was some kind of like funeral ritual inside there and they needed air. Wow. So interesting. And if the queen's if the queen's chamber was never finished, what was that for? If they just dipped out of the queen's chamber. Cause I was under the impression that it that it was a finished room. And it was either meant to be like a decoy room or you know. Uh, an alternative burial spot for the pharaoh if he, if he passed away early. Okay guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute alerts. Uh, let's see, TTS from Quickshot. I'm gonna replay it. Hopefully it plays. If you need it for air, you seal it initially and then when you've built up enough pyramid height and actually need it, you open it. But would that make sense? Like, how would you build up the sides more than the middle? Especially when the stones in the middle in this room are the heaviest. I'm not sure if that makes sense to me. Why do you seal it? Uh, they did this with all the pyramids, and I, th I think it's mostly to protect the pharaoh. When he's dead. Because all, all the pyramids before this one were robbed. They were very likely aware of grey robbers. Yeah, wow. I kind of want to watch it again, but now allowing myself to pause. 
I kind of want to watch it one more time, chat. But now, giving myself permission to pause and talk about things. <laughs> if you just played Cup of the Day and you're coming here, you know? Now we can actually, like, talk about it. I, f I felt so bad watching the first- I didn't want to stop him. Is there a best pyramid streamer award where I can vote for you? Can we do that? Can we just talk- like... I want to just talk about pyramids today. Amon, thank you for the 1,000 bits. There's no pyramid streamer award. Maybe sick, next year, but dude. I appreciate it. Thank you for the 1,000 bits. 90 centimeter massive, thank you as well. Let's go back. <laughs> Man, I feel quite ready going into this now. I feel like I can hold a presentation on this. Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Please subscribe and together subscribe we'll uncover to secrets from the past written in stone. If I had to pick the most emblematic feature of the Great Pyramid, it would have to be the small channels that emanate from the upper chambers in the structure. This is ironic because they are far from the most impressive feature of the pyramid. Yeah, the channels, like so so just so you know what we're looking at, right? Um if you're not familiar with the pyramid structure, once again. The shafts that are the entire topic of this video are the air shafts you see here. The king chamber ones lead to the outside. The queen chamber ones stop before they reach the outside, about 15 meters before. But like when you're a tourist, you walk in through the entrance on the right here. You walk up the ascending passageway, uh, or, yeah, through the robber's tunnel, up the ascending passageway, into the grand gallery, which is massive. And then into the king's chamber, which is just beautifully finished. And these are quite easy to overlook as like... They can't Some of the hold most magical craft. The this is the grand, grand gallery. gallery, or magnificent king's chamber with its flat granite. This granite block right here weighs about eighty-two tons. By the way, this one right here that I'm hovering my mouse over, and it's located directly above the sarcophagus. The gallery, or magnificent. The sarcophagus is behind the subtitles here. They wanted this one to protect the pharaoh. It's the heaviest granite block in the entire pyramid. Plot twist, the Egyptians just built a pile of rocks, and the rats built passageways and chambers <laughs> and vents. And just, just take a look at how finely finished all the walls are. That's also something. Like, each block is so tightly fitted together that, you know, they're, they're not even, like, centimeters apart. They're completely stacked, completely slotted in next to each other, and it's a beautiful room. Um... Which also contrasts to how, like, these channels, as soon as they make a turn, they're not that refined anymore. St. King's Chamber with its flat granite ceiling. But despite their modest size and supplementary role, there is something about the channels which captures the imagination. The unique... ...quickly <laughs> force the, the mind to travel through the massive stone and envision everything that might be hidden out of sight. A tantalizing hint that something, anything is still waiting to be discovered inside the pyramid. These small channels have been taunting explorers for millennia. The scars on the pyramid where they enter and exit the structure. It is, it is tantalizing though. I'm just trying to put myself in the mindset, like you're exploring a pyramid, you're going where no one has gone. You enter a room and there's literally nothing left to see except like a tiny tunnel. It's the size of your hand. You can't see through it because there's this a turn. You can't Dude. go further because you're too Plot big. Twist. They just carved the big 3D triangles out of sand and made it look like they build it with smart. They just generated it. Yeah, no. bear witness to past efforts to uncover their secrets. But despite many attempts, both modern like, and it's ancient very to decipher to their meaning, dig through there that has been no discovery there. to decisively determine a solution. But now, that's all going to change. In this video, so we're going to scrutinize the most popular theories for the ch Yeah, do you guys still believe they were pointing at the stars? Or do you believe they had a different purpose? Maybe you don't believe in that they were only air conditioning, but do you believe that they weren't just, oh, king to the stars? One, if you believe king to the stars. That's the main reason. I am not sure anymore. I am not sure. ...channels and show new evidence to determine their original purpose. As difficult as that sounds, the clues have always been there, waiting to be found. The history of exploration 
They were sealed and opened. I'm in trying the to channels think. Is a long tale of curiosity and innovation. Worthy exploration that? in the channels is oh, yeah, a long okay, tale yeah. of curiosity and innovation. Worthy of its own video. But I will give a brief summary here. The channels which travel from the king's chamber have been noted in descriptions okay, of the Great so Pyramid. We saw this. He's going through how the tunnels were. AD. He writes, quote, First discovered in the 1200s, at least that's how long people have known about them. Maybe before that too. That's the earliest documentation. Uh, people first dug tunnels on the side of them to see like, okay, where does this continue? Um... I forgot who he said dug this one, but yeah. He dug from the top of the Grand Gallery, basically, straight through the wall to try to follow this one, and then when he realized it goes like another 10 meters fully straight, he was like, nah, I'm Channel, out. Then followed its bend westward. The excavation ends as the channel straightens northward again, 12 meters deep into the pyramid from the king's chamber. Later, in 1837, it is from this vantage point that Howard Weiss observed one could see at least 35 feet without any Caviglia. opening or yeah. apartment. This explains why Caviglia's tunnel ended there, because it was grueling work with less than six inches. Six inches of progress per day. I mean, that's not a lot. We, we all have a good reference point of six inches. That is really not a lot of progress if you're digging a tunnel. Like, that's going to take a while. So, uh, understandable that they, they dipped. Day. During Vice's expedition in 1837, he hired a civil engineer John. That Shane is not Herring. a lot of progress. Herring was the first recorded person to spot the exit point of the King's Chamber Northern Channel. Average progress, maybe average progress. But yeah, look at this too. Like, how steep this is. Like, they don't allow climbing the pyramids anymore. But you, like, you make one misstep here, or you loosen some rubble, you will literally pass away. Like. You will die. It opens 70 70 meters, meters up. high up on the pyramid's northern face. This exit point for the northern channel was discovered extremely damaged, as it had been excavated about 11 meters they down. They call this the, what is it called, the Man Killer Tunnel? Yeah, this is the Man Killer Tunnel. The, the first, like, 11 meters down here, where they tried to enter the pyramid this way. Word just large enough for a small person to squeeze through. The northern channel was very plugged with sand and stones, and Howard Weiss's men spent many days slipping <laughs> God damn. <laughs> clearing it with boring rods. The southern channel Focus on the pyramid, was soon discovered afterwards, and it too was cleared of debris. <laughs> on May 29th, 1837, Focus upon on the pyramid, clearing the hello? southern channel, Weiss writes, quote, Upon the removal of this block, <laughs> the channel was completely open, an immediate rush of air took place, and we had the satisfaction of finding that the ventilation of the king's chamber was perfectly restored, and that the air within it was cool and fresh." End quote. At this time, the mystery of the channels was considered solved, their purpose was for ventilation, and the Great Pyramid was finally given- So like, yeah, they, they already thought, okay, they just get air into the pyramid, cool. Um, I don't know. It's almost like, like, the, the, I, and I think this is a human thing, it's, if, if an explanation is too simple, it feels like it cannot be right. You know? It's almost too simple. Like, my brain, my curiosity is yearning for there to be something more. Like, that's, that's too, that's too normal. Where's the mystery? Where's the intrigue? Where's the the wonder? What if this was used for like, you know, uh, something something cooler like communication or playing bowling down the head, like you know whatever it might be. It's it's almost like annoying in a way if this is the solution. They could play gutter ball. They could play the greatest game of ancient gutter ball and reprieve from the violent explorations that were it's undertaken. It's a pretty sick mini golf course. It's a sick mini golf course. You stand on the outside and you have to shoot 70 meters up and if you if it goes in the hole you get a grand prize. <laughs> 35 years later, however, the mystery was complicated by a discovery Whoa. made by Wayman Dixon and James Grant. 
Upon observing curious cracks in the southern wall of the queen's <laughs> chamber, Dixon probed a nearby joint with a wire it makes to what perfect he described sense. as an unconscionable That's what the lake. ball was for. This spot was then excavated to reveal a channel in the south wall, and from there Someone it was hit easily the... inferred that another channel... But, but, but this was also, like, the, where the ball was was here in the queen's chamber, and that was never open to the outside. ...ball was also present in the north wall. An article in the publication Nature on December 26th, 1872, documented this discovery. The article also contextualizes the enigma of this discovery. I want to see Dixon Wood Piece Carbon Dating. The wood dates to 3341 to 3090 BC, circa 500 years earlier than the Great Pyramid, which historical records date to the reign of Pharaoh Khufu between 2580 and 2560 BC. It's the wood that they found inside this when they open it, when Dixon opened it. These pieces of wood are about 500 years older in carbon dating, radiocarbon dating, than the pyramid itself. Uh, if you follow the historical... Um, record with like the king list and everything but it's possible this is still like fine because the egyptians were so scarce with wood stating quote the discovery of these but the channels, pyramid be older which than may be think. called dixon's channels in no Read way tends as yet to solve the enigma of the queen's chamber but rather to increase the sorry wait sorry i don't know if i want to read the entire article this could be due to the wood coming from the center of an old tree or because the timber was so scarce in Egypt that it was carefully reused and recycled for many years. The date does indicate that it was likely to have been left there at the time of the pyramid's construction, rather than belonging to later explorers. I mean, yes, but would they store, like, would they cut down a tree and then keep the planks for 500 years? Like, the, the timber. Is, is that likely? It seems like an absurd amount of time. Like, do we have examples nowadays of wood from the, you know, 1500s? Because you start radiocarbon dating at the time of an organism dying, right? So at the time of an organism dying, at the time the tree was cut, that's where you get this number from. And it varies a little bit, but within this range. There's an upper bound and a lower bound. Difficulties of the solution. End quote. Upon their opening, the Queen's Chamber channels revealed three artifacts left. And like, keep in mind, this is also not nowadays, but a long time ago. Construction of the Great Pyramid. And it seems like it was just waste. Ball, an even smaller copper hook, and a short length of cedar wood. Known as the Dixon relics, they were all at various What is dated times. to when it grew? Is it? Am I wrong about that? How is wood radiocarbon dated? When radiocarbon dating a piece of wood or charcoal, the event is dated. The event dated is the growth of the tree ring. Trees grow by the addition of rings, and these rings stop exchanging carbon with the biosphere once they're laid down. Oh. Yes, yeah, so if it's a really old tree, if it's a really old tree and there are a ton of rings, you get like a bonus buff from that. Okay. Okay. I'm learning it's new things. Lost within museums. Fortunately, it could be today the middle of an old tree. Yeah. For. It was initially assumed the Queen's Chamber channels would also penetrate to the exterior of the pyramid, but later explorers searched for them, only to come up empty-handed. In 1880, can we carbon date Virgil now? <laughs> two, Flinders Petrie took Not detailed yet. measurements of the channels using a goniometer and even looked down them with a telescope. With Soon you can radiocarbon date the main channel. We're at like half a year. It's like half a year since the organism last took a breath of air. The main channel. It's, it's, it's not, yeah, we need to, we need to revive that thing. And the angle of the sun was ideal. He was interested in using the channels as a reference point for analyzing the original angle of the pyramid casing stone. The main channel as previously rings. noted by Vice and Pairing, oh, the no. channels all have some bend or twist to them. After extensive analysis, Petrie was left okay, to- Okay, so we're seeing the numbers. I don't know if we can do much with these numbers. Maybe some people can. Like, I really hope 
And I think History for Grant also hopes that the more of this stuff he does, the more smart people and interested people contribute their own ideas and we all get closer to the solution. He's, he's never claiming to be the be-all, know-all. Um, but he just presents his findings. So, uh, well, let's see. Um, and this is just the history of it. I kind of want to skip ahead a little bit. Um, one thing he touches on is how often Egyptology will find an answer, and then they will stick to it. And so he made an example of um, one guy who just said, oh, you know, they, uh, the, the, the channels, he didn't think they were sealed originally. More than a few feet upwards into the pyramid. Reisner's incorrect assumption about the Queen's Chamber channels was an early example of the controversy Egyptology faced about their purpose. It also was part of a troubling trend where researchers simply invent parameters for the channels this guy required signals. to fit their Dude. theory. One year with the goat. Thanks for everything you do, brother. P.S. Imagine the ancient Egyptians spending <laughs> hundreds of years creating the pyramids to have a Norwegian streamer analyze their work. But I am analyzing it in awe and in appreciation. Imagine building that shit for people to think they, the aliens did it. It's like, oh. You build something so good. It's it's like when, it's literally like when someone is so good at a game that other people think they're cheaters. Like, oh, this is too good for how smart you guys were back then, so you, you cheated. You used aliens. But no. Like, the, the evidence is that they built this, this thing. This still occurs with present Egyptologists. John Romer's 2007 book on the Great Pyramid claims of the Queen's Chamber channels, quote... Despite claims that the ends of these two hidden shafts were never left uncut at their point to the entrance of the chamber, practicalities of stone cutting make it more likely that the two square holes were closed with two well-made flickstein. Um, yeah, this was what this guy got wrong, the uh, Egyptologist. He said, like, oh, they... They just had... They placed a stone here that would perfectly fit this hole instead of the wall itself being covered with these which had been rendered invisible by the copious deposits of soot and salt. End quote. There is still a piece of the uncut northern channel in place, which proves Romer is incorrect and not serious about investigating the mystery. <laughs> in addition I think, I think this is academically one of the strongest things you can say is like, oh, you're not serious. I love these little like quips at, at people that are sort of the experts in this field. It's like, do your job properly, you know? A century prior. Upon completion of the job, Edgar writes, quote, As the result of these two channels being open, the temperature in the interior of the pyramid immediately decreased, making the inside of the building very much more comfortable. But I do wonder, right? I do wonder. Would it make sense for the pyramid to be left open for a little bit? Because think about how many people this would require, right? It would require thousands upon thousands of people. To, to build it, to source the materials, to uh, captain the boats that traveled uh, with the granite, you know, uh, all the logistics, the families of the people. Like, this would almost be a celebration of what they could do as a society back then. I wonder if they would, like, let people inside after. ...to work in, and more comfortable for the numerous visitors too. For it used to be very hot in the pyramid. And you say, why would the workers not be allowed air? If you think about how the pyramid was built, you, you start from the bottom and then you work your way up. So this room could be sealed way before they completed the pyramid and they would have the open sky with fresh air as they were working. But yeah, when they buried the pharaoh itself, it would probably be, probably be very dense air inside there. End quote. If Edgar they didn't goes on have these. to build some masonry at the outer ends of the king's chamber channels to prevent them from being Maybe that's why. up again. Here is a rare picture of the southern channel taken by Edgar before he began construction. Edgar reported this job was successful 10 Are years later when he visited the bottom? I think in 1938, so. noting that both... But okay, um... And later writers of England... Let's see. ...that each channel is pointed towards a... But yeah, none of we the don't believe in the star theory. Lost, so the most important... Jesus Christ, guys, this man is making it hard to look at the pyramids. It can't be, can't be walking around with that. 
when we're conducting science. We need professional dress codes during the scientific experiments. It's not alright. It's not okay. Precise Ooh. alignment can be thrown out immediately. No wonder it's feeling so a little hot near the pyramids. Option, I will consider a more generic version, which allows for loosely aligned channels. <laughs> passage constructed extremely. Th this is another like. There are so much precision in in how the pyramids were built. Like the entire way. The pyramids are exactly the same length on all sides, which you might think is easy to achieve, but they're. 240 meters long at the base and the longest side is only seven centimeters longer than the shortest side that's you know american wise that's like two football fields almost and and you're off by a couple of inches like it's it's extremely precise in how it's a square base uh the angle of incline is the same it continues all the way at 45 degrees, if I remember correctly, 45. And it's also positioned so that it's almost perfectly north, south, east, west. All these tunnels are about one meter in, in like, yeah, two cubits, two Egyptian cubits. So one meter, one meter, one meter, one meter, or one meter, oh, two or oh, three or whatever it is, if you convert from royal cubits to meters. But the same opening all the way. They're not big rooms, but you have to like kind of duck down and crawl in. But it's very, it's very Great. In contrast symmetrical. to the northern channels of the Great Pyramid, which have the most bend. This discrepancy is never explained, and it's important to note. Seven centimeter, kind of big margin of error for serving even back then. But it's like, like what is a seven centimeter difference across 240 meters? What level of precision does that give you? What's the, what, how do you set up the equation for that? Like, what is, what is, it would be 0 0.07 meters out of 240 meters that are incorrect, right? I don't know how, how you, <laughs> it's not 2%. It isn't, so it, yeah, it's 0.029%. So you could say it is 99.98% perfect sides with heavy stones Five, four and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, 99.98% perfect. Or 97. And then you also have like the, the, the way it's rotated towards north, south, east, west. It's also the same, like 99.9%. 7% accurate. That construct Oh, 51. Yeah, sorry, 51, not 45. My bad. Every other entrance 51. perfectly straight was much more difficult 51 than degrees building of incline. the small channels of the Great Pyramid. If the builders wanted the channels straight, they would have been built straight. But the earlier... The, the base as well is also almost perfectly flat. Like, they, they had to level of the Giza Plateau to be almost perfectly flat first. ventilation was thrown into turmoil by the discovery of the Queen's Chamber channels. They never penetrated to the chamber or the outside of the pyramid, so how could ventilation be their purpose? Thus, a spiritual explanation was the best that could be established. Here is Egyptologist Zahi Hawass explaining his- Wait, do not tell me that the truck we've been looking at is the truck of Zahi Hawass. Sorry guys, I gotta conduct some research here. <laughs> no, that's not him. Okay. <laughs> It would be a terrible misfortune if we were... Uh... Is Egyptologist Zahi Hawass explaining his <laughs> version. My theory that I believe that the South Shaft functioned, uh, it's a symbolic <laughs> corridor for the soul of the king as the sun god Ra. The Northern one, it's also a model corridor for the king as the god Horus okay. to join the Northern Star. Egyptology so we, we've looked at all the star alignments. I kind of want to go past that. Pyramid was really hot internally. And Gantenbrink wanted to um, help with installing air conditioning through these shafts. But then he also wanted to drive his robot up there and take pictures, which he did. They found the copper pins. Um, the copper pins were a big deal back then. 
Um, but even after drilling through that block, they didn't find much behind it. Mm. Okay, let's watch this part. As the pyramid was constructed, every channel would need to be sealed intermittently to prevent rain and sand from clogging it up. The copper pin blocking stones we see today are perfectly yeah, suitable this was super for the task. The floor and ceiling stones of the channels have separated joints, and so the protruding floor could hold a blocking. Because, like during construction, right? You would have to think about this. You would have to think about this while you're building each floor, um, or each course rather after the king chamber. Uh, if you go to uh, paint. So you're, you, you build the king's chamber. I'm going to make a very crude drawing here. King's chamber looks something like this. And then you have your uh, relieving chambers. And then you have the, the room itself below this. Right? This is how the king's chamber tends to uh, look. Very, very crude drawing. But okay. King's chamber down here. Cool. And then you would have your... your Jesus, this is terrible. You'd have your shafts down here. Wait. So this, this would be the room. And the, the, the shafts go up here, right? So if you're build, like mid-building the pyramid, let's imagine these are the, the tallest floors, right? Actually, it's more, like, it's more like here. Terrible, but okay. You're building the pyramid, and like above you here would just be clear sky. Sorry. This part up here would just be like clear sky right now. So with each floor that you place above here, you have to, like, place the stones in order so that... So that you account for this. You have to, you know, create this tunnel on the way. You cannot dig this after. You can, I don't think you can dig this after. I think you're too far deep in the masonry. There's gonna be way too many stones on top. Like, you're, you're... You have to do this. You have to have the foresight, the planning to do this during. Right? So with each course of stone you place on top of this... So, so they were thinking about this along the way, and that's also why the plugging makes a lot of sense. They place more and more plugging stones like this. Okay. King slab in place with gravity until the next ceiling stone was ready. In the King's Chamber Southern Channel, there are two anomalous niches cut into the walls, which would also facilitate a similar sized blocking stone. The Queen's Chamber channels may simply be unfinished, and the copper pin blocking stones left in place after the channels were abandoned. It's possible the copper hook and handle were part of a tool used to pry the blocking slabs loose if they were temporarily plastered during construction, but they could be totally unrelated items as well. Shots are always the other corner of stones. Uh, one of them wasn't. It was dug uh, in between two because it had to match up with the other one on the wall. Verify that labeling any part of a pyramid as unfinished is difficult to prove because the craftsmanship within them varies substantially. The Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber is the only space with- This room has always been really fascinating to me. It's like, they made such a long tunnel down here. And then started digging out this room and then kind of just left it. Uh, again. It's so nice that we have this map here to go back to. This is the subterranean chamber. This corridor is another one of those that's two cubits, so it's perfectly one meter, just about. And uh, you get down to the subterranean chamber, there's just nothing there, except like a, a hollowed outcrop like this. Within any Old Kingdom pyramid that can be called unfinished without controversy. Assessing what do they if want the Queen's with it? Chamber channels were unfinished requires an evaluation of the Queen's Chamber itself, and so let's take a closer look. There are four main characteristics of the Queen's Chamber to support the idea it was never finished, and I will list them from weakest... So th this is a part that went a little fast for me when he was doing the explanations. Especially the third point. I want to I wanna understand this. So we're going to go through it a bit slower now to strong and see if we can understand it. The first it. is that older accounts claim its walls were rough and unpolished. So when they went back in here after a long time of the pyramids being unvisited, there was salt and stuff on the walls. And, and when that was removed, it seemed like the walls were actually in pretty good shape, right? But as Flinders Petrie observed, there was a large amount of crystalline salt growth in the chamber, which would create this appearance. With the salt removed, the quality of the finish is quite standard. We can strike yeah, so this, this one, one as evidence completely. 
The Not second true. is the openings of the channels themselves remaining sealed. For a period after their discovery, this was a common assumption, that they were unused channels due to their concealment. They were sealed and they were unused due to their concealment? But it would be circular reasoning to use them as evidence for the Queen's Chamber being unfinished if our purpose is to evaluate the channels. So, we can't count this one. Okay. The third so is the far condition I'm of the up. chamber floor, and the floor of the passage leading Yeah, this got me confused. The floor of the passage leading to it. So, if we look at how smoothly dressed some stones in the king's chamber are for comparison, uh, this starts to look pretty, like, damaged. To it. The entire surface of both chamber too, and passage very are rough core masonry. Finished chambers have smooth, fine... This is the king's chamber. Very beautiful stonework. Some damage on the wall, but that's in later times, probably from robbers and shit. Um, but the Quality original work is insane. Which is not present in the queen's chamber. An excuse put forth is that the floor must have been entirely ripped up by tre- But, so, it, th this floor has been ripped up. Like, where you see here, in this outcrop, people actually dug down in the floor. Uh, to look for hidden chambers below here, below the queen's chamber floor, and they never found anything. But it has been dug up. Treasure hunters, but this is an extremely weak argument. Other pyramid chambers with dugout floors have some bits left at the edges. Yeah. Even the single example of the Red Pyramid's entirely missing floor shows obvious traces of where it once existed. The problem is complicated by the Queen's Chamber subfloor showing signs of having been built upon, but not in a manner for setting finished pavement. The subfloor mm. has been cut down in the center of the room, with a consistent 75 centimeter gap between the cuttings and the walls. This got me confused. I'm not sure if I'm seeing, like, without the outline of the yellow. The floor showing signs of having been built upon, but not in a manner for setting finished pavement. The subfloor here has been cut down in the center of the room with a con- Oh, okay, now I see it. Yeah, I see the outlines here. Consistent 75 yeah. centimeter gap between the cuttings and the walls. Egyptian okay. builders always cut down a lower block to fit one that would be set atop it. Observing this in the Queen's Chamber, Petrie writes, quote, These sunken edges are well seen in other parts of the core masonry. Yeah, here we can definitely see it. And their meaning here is unequivocal. Petrie is thus left to conclude of the floor, quote, It has been built over with similar rough masonry, which was afterwards stripped down to... So they did have an elevated floor here with probably finer blocks, and then that was taken Insert down. Insert the chamber walls. End quotes. Additionally, it does not make sense why looters would strip the entire horizontal passage of thin pavement without further excavation. The missing floor of the Queen's Chamber and passage are thus probable evidence of an unfinished Okay, but the space. last one was quite clear. Finally, the western corner of the Queen's Chamber This one is very interesting. A Th this is something they would almost never allow themselves to do. Like, if you think about, th this is so imperfect, compared, like, this is probably, like, 50% imperfect. And it's a very important detail in a room, compared to, like, um, the, the pyramid uh, accuracy, and, like, how, how square it is being, like, 99.9%. They would not allow themselves to do this. Projection of extra stone, which was never dressed smooth. Of this projection, Petrie writes, quote, it is really a surplus left on both sides of the corner in order to protect the stone in transit and in course of building. This undressed part in the chamber is cut away down to the true surface at the top and at the middle joint in order to show the workman exactly to where it needed to be dressed in finishing it off. End quote. This is 100% unfinished yeah, work. this is clear. And this corner would perhaps be the last part of the Queen's Chamber wall. This construction video takes into account all air tunnels? Uh, we could check that out. Alls to complete because it's the most fragile and vulnerable I have actually edge. wanted for a long time to look at different pyramid theories. And with just the knowledge level that I have, try to uh, dispel some of them. But I am not an Egyptologist, I'm not a scientist, I am just, just an avid fan. Interpreting this There's unfinished a lot of bad corner theories gets out interesting there. because the physical evidence is incontrovertible. 
As Petrie points out, even the unfinished part has been meticulously crafted with a reference line in the middle joint so that the job could be finished as quickly and easily as possible. This is not comparable to other undressed stones where the finish is haphazardly incomplete. Accidentally leaving the edge rough is highly suspicious. Like, look at how smooth everything else is, and then this is unfinished. It, it makes no sense. Especially, like, if you, you're spending 20 to 30 years building the pyramid, you're not gonna not take the extra one hour to do this. Because of the minimal effort necessary to complete it. An hour At of that one scale, worker's like time one hour is nothing to fix this compared is... to the Great Pyramid as a whole. I should also add... <laughs> Undressed stones excite Add me. That the Queen's chamber this is super fascinating. This is something we didn't even get to touch on, but the Grand Gallery, it, it, so this, if you look at the left side here, the tunnel that goes to the left here leads to the Queen's chamber. Uh, and the tunnel that goes up where this man is walking leads to the King's chamber. And there's a part here where you can see a very steep hill and certain like gaps in the wall. That's what you see on the left here. The, the black markings are, are holes in the wall where it's suspected that they would have a wooden ramp and when they blocked up the pyramid, when they, they closed it up, they had granite plugging stones that would go all the way down from the Grand Gallery and into the ascending passageway, completely blocking everything up. Our passage was designed so that it would be blocked off and this is not... Comp and it's also suspected that these, like, you see these uh, holes on the side here were used to hold... Um, this is Jean-Pierre Houdin's theory, which Egyptology disagrees with, but that they were used to have uh, sort of like a, um, like a contraption to help uh, counterweight, uh, counterweight to lift heavy stones. Comparable to any other pyramid. It's an important anomaly which lacks explanation. Interpreting the Queen's Chamber... I saw a really fascinating video about this on Ancient uh, Architects. Great channel And too. its channels as incomplete would support a ventilation theory for the King's Chamber channels, and so let's discuss that idea in detail. A common argument against ventilation is that the channels are not optimized for airflow based upon their design. This is an extremely weak argument because... I, I think his argument here is strong, though. Because I thought if you just want the best airflow, you make them, like, fully just sideways. Making them up makes them shorter and you get quicker air. Because the channels do conduct air in the modern era. It's often suggested the channels would be more efficient this if is they strong, were entirely I think. horizontal, but this is... Like, this is almost, uh, I would guess, almost twice the length. ...is incorrect. The aperture of the channels, combined with the shortness of their length, are the most important variables for air to push through a relatively straight conduit. By angling the channels upward, and the Egyptians a good wind catcher, gave them yeah. the shortest path to the edge of the pyramid. This is also the simplest explanation for their varying angles of inclination. The Queen's chamber channels are within I guess one what degree. I don't understand is also why they... No, he explained this. He explained this. You would also probably want to have them high up on the walls because warm air rises to the top of a room and would leave the pyramid that way. But... He explained this by the fact that it would be very scary to put massive 80-ton granite slabs on the roof of the king's chamber and then also dig holes into the walls right next to them. ...of each other, but the king's chamber northern channel is 12 degrees less than its counterpart on the south. The king's chamber is off-center from the pyramid's axis, and thus the difference in inclination still follows the shortest path to the pyramid's edge for both channels. It's true that the lateral bends both northern channels yeah. take would slightly reduce airflow, but this seems a minor complaint compared to sending the pharaoh's soul on a dogleg journey to the <laughs> circumpolar stars. Finally, the location of the channels in the pyramid chamber... Yeah, here, right? You would think it might be more logical to raise this up, but maybe not when you... Like, these are all extremely heavy granite slabs. ...seems perfectly adequate for this purpose of ventilation. Placing them near the ceiling would greatly complicate the roofing process and make them even more vulnerable to the lateral thrust of the saddle vaults. The lowest joints in the Queen's Chamber channels are constructed differently to perhaps resist some of the huh. extra lateral force in that location. The Egyptians may also have simply preferred to have the channels at a height where they could set a lamp or inspect for intrusive debris. 
A study by Gunther Muge calculated an air transport of <laughs> 75 to 118 cubic meters per hour. It's hard to pronounce the all these different names from all these different countries. You got like German names, you got Italian names. It's, yeah. For the king's chamber, and so a design for ventilation was perfectly adequate. It's also important to investigate the architecture of the channel blocks to determine what the Egyptians were intending for their purpose. Except where the channels bend or open, they consist of two stones fitted together the same way. The walls and ceiling are made from a single stone, cut into a U shape, and then inverted. This upside-down U is set on top of a flat stone, which makes up the floor. Yeah. It's a great settlement or falling out of alignment. Can we just skip a little bit ahead here? Because we know how the stones look, and we know... Th this was an interesting part, that like they have these stones already in Cairo architecture for water. So it could be a natural line of reasoning to think that they would use them. Okay. The channels have proven effective for climate control within the pyramid. However, there is a very big problem with this explanation. There is no established reason why a burial chamber within a pyramid would require ventilation in the first place. And this is probably one of the biggest questions, right? Like. For tourism, it makes perfect sense. For working, it makes perfect sense. But no one was supposed to be in this room until the pharaoh was dead, he was buried, it was left, and it was plugged up. You need no air after that. And they could easily, like, plug these up from the outside afterwards. Which they didn't. Which they didn't. The Great Pyramid is unique in that its entrance is below the chambers. Here you can see the, the plugging blocks, by the way, the granite plugging blocks in the ascending passage. Within it, and this does cause a buildup of smoke, heat, and condensation that does not quickly dissipate. Groups of people with heat-emitting lamps make it uncomfortable. As You thought they never find any mummies in the pyramids? Uh, they didn't find a mummy in this pyramid, but it's also the biggest pyramid and would have been grave robbed for thousands of years including the tunnel that you see here, which is the infamous robber's tunnel. So yeah, it's very likely that there was a mummy inside it, but it was, it was grave robbed. And this dissipate. Groups of people with heat-emitting lamps make it uncomfortable, as seen by <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> the funny thing is I know which interview this is. This is from when they drilled past the... Um, they drilled through the, the, the block with the copper handles. And they didn't find anything, and it was it was live streamed, it was live streamed on Nash, like on TV, and he had to explain how you know there was nothing interesting behind those blocks. The was perspiring within them on live TV. But the workers of ancient Egypt endured worse environments than the king and queen's chambers, including the well shaft, subterranean chamber, and the miles of tunnels underneath Djoser's pyramid. Oh hell yeah, you're in on this shit. Hell yeah, K4, nice to see you. <laughs> Furthermore, most of the work on the king and queen's chambers would be complete before they were roofed over with restricted airflow. I, I, think, I think one of the things I, I find like difficult to understand as well about the pyramid, maybe someone smarter than me can explain me this, but you're, you're, you're existing 5,000 years ago, okay? 4,500 years ago. You're digging a tunnel down like this, and it's a very precise tunnel. It's... it's Two cubits wide in all directions. Two cubits by two cubits by two cubits by two cubits. For simplification, one meter each way. One meter wall, one meter roof, etc. You get a very high level of precision digging this tunnel down. Uh, and to dig that tunnel that precisely, you need light. So they're going to probably use a torch or some kind of thing, right? How are they not getting like massive air poisoning by working in this environment? And they dug far down. I don't know how long the descending passageway is, I would guess. Maybe like 50 to 100 meters. But it seems like the further down you get here, just the more poisoned air you're going to breathe in. They might have. They might have. But, but that's like, logistically, it's very hard to understand how they did it. This lack of explanation for why the Great Pyramid would require ventilation that makes it an unsuitable answer for many researchers. One more way to evaluate the importance of stonework to ancient Egyptians... Also, oh, yeah, the cubits, by the way, the Egyptians, they used um, the measurement of the king's 
arm from the elbow to the tip of his longest finger, I think. I think that's one cubit. And it ends up being about 52 centimeters. And then they made uh, sticks that were exactly the same length and they used that for measurements. 52 or 53 centimeters. Is roughly. to look at how finely finished the stones are. This method was pioneered by Flinders Petrie, and it remains one of the best tools we have for consideration. The robots of the past few decades have given us a good look inside the channels, and the workmanship is highly irregular, as if they weren't very important. Also, like, it's, you know, the, there's the entire argument, like, where are the, the slaves? Do the slaves build this, or were they just workers? I think there is one narrative that Egypt really wants you to, 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 to think, and that is that, oh, this was an ethical building. You should come visit it. It was an ethical building. The workers were in great condition. No human atrocities were committed in the building of this monument. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic monument, and it shows how cool Egypt is. Egypt didn't use slaves. No, they were, they were paid workers, and this was just part of our culture. And like, yes, okay, that might be true to some extent, but like, I don't know, dude, like 4,500 years ago, slavery was so widespread, not just in Egypt, but in all parts of the world, right? It's very likely that there, there was a mix, like they were paid for their work, but also forced to do the work. If an empty channel for a king's soul was necessary, why should the soul be chafed, tripped, nudged, squeezed, and twisted on its way through. In addition to channels for air or souls, other ideas have been presented, but they venture into even greater speculation. Channels for communication is one idea, but this seems even less necessary than air. Channels for magical waters to flow into the pyramid are another spin. Yeah, this is the one I, I'm gonna stop saying this. I don't think I don't think <laughs> I don't think I believe this anymore. That it was to send the king's spirit. It might be. It might be both on a spiritual what is that this is the um idea that those shafts are to send hi. the hi Pochi uh the idea that the king spirit after the burial is sent to the great waterway in the sky the you know so he can be reborn interpretation this guy the Sigma essence of the enigma dude. rests upon Finally whether the channels were open or closed we'll track closed or channels <laughs> wouldn't have a utilitarian <laughs> it's a purpose, different stream today and open we're only talking about pyramids do you guys enjoy this is it too wild for you have you tried watching this and giving it a shot and figured out like it's a little wild or do you like it one if you like it two if you just wanted me to play a couple today today I, I think it's interesting this is something i'm really passionate about I mean, I've been watching Pyramid videos for about a year, right? I think I started last December. And I, I, I really watch a lot of Pyramid videos. Like, I, I am very passionate about this stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I, and we're getting closer to an answer. We're getting a lot closer to an answer. This is the new video from History for Gannett that he posted today, and we're just... We watched it once through without any breaks, and now we're just talking about each part a spiritual one. If we can determine which was the case, we can break the stalemate of which explanation is the likely candidate. The pyramids of Egypt are so far removed from the present that any design choice can seem mysterious. That is true. The best analytical method for me has been comparing them in sequence for a greater context. And usually when you compare things in sequence, you would find that things tend to get better over time. Cars 100 years ago are worse than cars today. Uh, houses 400 years ago are less complex than houses today. Like, things tend to get better and better and better. But this pyramid and its internal structure is unmatched. No pyramid before or after has had the same complexity inside of it. And it's the only pyramid with those shafts. But the Great Pyramid channels stand alone. There is no pyramid to compare them to. We are very lucky, however, that there are four separate channels, each with its own characteristics, that can be compared to each other. And this will be just enough to get us the answer. So the only thing so you can compare to is desire. the pyramid itself. Ready? Deep breath. And then this part again. Let's and see it. Here we go. First, we return to 1837. John, John Shea Pering was clearing the S-tier archaeologist. After having unplugged <laughs> Holy, the northern one. Holy, not again, the northern man. Channel I'm at work. They gotta stop this. 
I am at work. They should not be presenting <laughs> not safe for work content. It's the longest and least inclined <laughs> channel, which made unplugging it an enormous challenge. Pairing was expecting a similar Jesus. challenge at the South and thus had J.R. Hill blast the pyramid around the channel <laughs> to make a wild. working platform for heavy equipment. In preparation for this work, Pairing or Hill decided that it was necessary to remove the highest remaining block that comprised part of the southern channel. It's never explicitly written it's that so they removed this block, but it disappeared after their job, and it's the most likely explanation. But pairing leaves us documentation of this missing block, understanding that its removal will forever destroy a piece of evidence that was minor for him, but major for us. He draws a sketch of the block from two angles. And, and here's what we got to remember. Like, like, some historians have had terrible accounts that are provably false. Like people like Herodotus in ancient Greece, he's called the father of lies where basically almost everything that guy documented was just wrong. Pairing, however, has a much better track record. A lot of the stuff he documented is trustworthy, and so this is one thing you can't really verify because this stone doesn't exist anymore. But if, like, most of what other things Pairing said was true and trustworthy, why should we doubt that he saw this block and removed it and then drew it here, you know? And writes, he has a good rep. Quote, it curved downward horizontally as shown by the dotted lines, probably with- Curved down horizontally. How does that look if it- so... It curves down horizontally. Right now, it, is he saying that... He's standing on the outside and it curved down horizontally. Is it pointing up or like down the stone? I, I mean, my, Microsoft Paint. So he's standing on the outside of the pyramid. Uh, let's let's do this. So he's standing here, on like a, his little plateau. This Here's pairing, dude. Yay! I'm doing archaeology. Woohoo! Give him a little smile and his little hat. He had like a, like a nice hat, a nice little Santa hat. Oh no, that's not a hat. Uh, I think it looks more like this. Okay, here we have herring. He is looking at a block that is over here, and he says it's- so the, the, the tunnel, we already know, goes like this, right? Okay, cool, the tunnel goes like here. When he's saying it's curving down horizontally, does he mean that it's like pointing down like this? Or that he is looking at it, and he's seeing that it's pointing down? Is it one or two? That's what I didn't understand. Or if it's like a little like house outcrop here. The ladder? It's two. So he is seeing. He is standing here and he's seeing, oh. He has to remove one block here that's kind of blocking everything. Which contains the tunnel and it is pointing down. I'm terrible at drawing. Look at the drawing. Yeah, I didn't fully understand. It's, it says line of former external casing. Can maybe make this easier for you guys to see as well. Line of formal external casing. Because here it looks flat. Horizontal to me means flat. And there's a dotted line. So is A... Is that- does that mean what the block would be? As shown by the dotted lines. Oh, so it goes to flat. It goes to flat, and then he could see that it- Ah, okay, no, sorry, I'm trolling, I'm trolling. Sorry, sorry, uh, that must be so frustrating for you guys. Uh, I'm trolling. So he sees that it's flat here, but he can tell that it's curving downwards after. Right? He removes this stone. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for helping me understand that, chat. The view of preventing the sand from choking it up. End quote. 
In 1837, after having cleared the Northern Channel, it was taken for granted that the channels were for conducting <laughs> air. You know. But John Pering was the most talented researcher to ever document the pyramids, and he always went above and beyond with details. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it, the tier but list. if you were to make a tier Okay, let me see who I recognize here. So you got Pering, uh, you got Flinders Petrie, you got Howard Weiss. Um, you definitely have. I'm trying to. I think this is Caviglia. Wait, what's the guy? What's the guy who writing on Khafra Pyramid Chamber? It's Belzoni, right? Belzoni Portrait. Giovanni Belzoni. I don't see him on here. Belzoni Kafra. It was him. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's another name I know. Belzoni is B tier? Oh, that's him. Yeah, this is him. This is Belzoni. Okay, so he was pretty good. The one thing he did which still upsets me is that he just hard griefed. The Pyramid of Khafra. He was the guy who went into this chamber first. And look at this! Explored by Belzoni, the 2nd of March, 1818. Total grief. You go into this, he, he dug up the floor as well, and then he leaves like graffiti on the walls. Several thousand year old <laughs> room. And, and this is still there. Total griefing. But the work he did, he documented pretty well, I think. There's a shaft too. These do not extend far. These are only like, I think, small indents, about one meter. Equivalent of dry wetting first in the comment section, yes. What about the guy who caused the Great Breach? Wait, the Great Breach. There was a guy who used dynamite on the pyramid. I want to see who this guy was. <laughs> which, uh, which sounds pretty stupid, and believe me, it was. Uh, wait. It, it's probably this guy. It's probably F tier. Wait, who was this? I've seen him before. Uh, Dyna Might on Pyramid X. What is it called? Exploration? Vice and pairing. Expl it was vice and pairing? Vice and pairing explored the Menkara Pyramid Complex and some of his Queen's Pyramids. Although they recorded their activities with previously unknown attention to detail, their use of gunpowder and dynamite to find Imagine spending your life researching the pyramids just to be placed at F tier on someone's explorer tier list a few hundred years later. And imagine losing to the guy that's using gunpowder and dynamite. S tier, and he's using dynamite to find pyramid entrances. <laughs> what? How terrible do you have to be as F tier? I am so curious who this F tier guy is. I, I really want to know. Sulenko, thank you. Does anyone rec does anyone know? Yeah, I see advices here. S tier pairing, uh, Flinders Petrie. Uh, this guy is known too. I'm trying to jog my memory. Reverse image search, maybe. This guy I know as well. This guy's a very old explorer. Um, I forget his name. But 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 your ranking yeah. of pyramid researchers pairing would be the only S tier. There is who is the worst Egyptologist in ancient history. I'm just seeing Sahih Hawass, I'll be honest. It's very, it's very interesting you search this, and the third result is Sahih Hawass. <laughs> it's, 
anyways. There's no higher standard for a testimony in this line of work. Unfortunately, Pering's drawing isn't quite as detailed as his description. He describes the channel curving downward, but in his drawing, only a vertical joint Yeah, this confused certain. us. This slight ambiguity has led countless researchers afterwards to entirely ignore Pering's analysis. Everyone who wanted an elegant channel pointed toward the sky just assumes Pering List of was wrong, and nobody has ever had the guts to explain why. Researchers Maragioglio I mean, and Jesus. Rinaldi even agree that ventilation... Rinaldi? Wait, can we look back? Yeah, this is Maraglio and Rinaldi. Uh, let's go back to the tier list. Rinaldi looks like that. Rinaldi is C tier. And Mariglio as well, C tier. This line of work. And no, I draw the string. But Pering doesn't just draw the joint, he describes the channel as curving Omega downward. Networks, thank you. And while even Pering has made mistakes, he got a very, very good look at this block. In the modern day, we know that channels don't have vertical joints, except where- F First F tier is Emile Chassina. Emile Chassina mistakes. I am doing this guy dirty. He has a very short Wikipedia page. He doesn't say what he did wrong. We cannot send him, we cannot condemn and his crimes. Angles, but Pering couldn't have known this was the case, even if he suspected it. There is one <laughs> anomalous well, vertical the joint in the four channels, <laughs> Just a little mistake. and thus we can never be 100% certain that Pering's analysis was correct. However, if you're being honest about the probability of this scenario, it's much more likely that Pering got it right, and that there were details other than the vertical joint that we can't see in the so drawing. So I'm, I'm okay with this. Okay, here. Egyptology has not always accepted Pering's work as part of its canon because he predates the discipline. He predates the discipline. So when they go back to the earliest work, like the earliest documentation, they don't look at this guy because he kind of came before Egyptology. So the drawings they look at, like the example History for Granite gave was this other pyramid, the pyramid of Sahur, where he had to look at another drawing of Borchhart instead of Pering's one, which was uh, more accurate, although drawn 70 years earlier. It, Ludwig Borchert came with his nicely... Everyone followed his plans, but he did not excavate. I made this mistake, and I followed his plan. Of course, I have to, because it's the well accepted one. We started, of course, with Borchert plans. I couldn't work. Yes, we can watch it for a third time. This was the most accepted If we miss one. some details, we if can watch I, it for a third I, I time. Go back Thoughts? To, to John Beering, no one will believe me because I'm not following the proper one. I must say, Khaled deserves great pyramid of Sahure. Since Pering was the last and only witness to the southern channel curving to horizontal, many Egyptologists have pretended it never happened because none of them ever documented it. As bizarre as that sounds, remember John Romer is inaccurately characterizing the Queen's Chamber channel openings where the stone still exists today. Knowing the King's Chamber yeah. channels leveled out to horizontal is- Now this is what you'll find. The more pyramid videos you look at, the more you see how a lot of the experts do get things wrong. It's okay if you get things wrong, but- 24 hour stream just watching history for granite. You know, I mean, you guys should you guys should watch them for twenty four hours straight. I'm mean, I I feel uh, we already you know I I like watching and talking about and reacting to videos that I'm passionate about, but I also feel that the ethical part of it is that it's only uh, good if I interest you in his channel. It's only good if I give you a sample and then you go out there and have a full meal at his restaurant, so to speak. So I think if you guys are interested in this, I, I recommend you to watch more. But um, but yeah, I do not want to watch this entire channel on stream. That'll be bad. 
extremely important because it's strong evidence the channels opened all the way through the casing stones. The whole channel is amazing. Yeah. The builders would make this decision is this obvious. This is something I wanted to, to point out, by the way. He stumbled upon this discovery, right, with the channels, and we're going to see it again. If you missed it the first time, we're going to see it again. But there's another video on his channel where he says, and it's so fun, he says, I recently stumbled upon this drone footage of the pyramid in 4K quality, and I would find myself pausing and just staring at the rocks for hours and hours looking for patterns. Like, this is how he, he does it. He opens a picture of the pyramid and just stares at it for a few hours. And with this one, and this is footage I've seen him use before, he, he saw some of the best pictures he'd ever seen of the peak of the pyramids. And from a vantage point that you wouldn't have access to in ancient history. And, and it rebukes many criticisms what you of might the notice theory. Uh, you can't really notice it here, but what, what, you, what you might notice is that um, the stones in the middle here do not uh, lie in a square shape. They're kind of tilted slightly diagonally inside the pyramid, which could support this guy, Sigma is a internal yeah. spiraling ramp. Weekly pyramid streams, people shy. A lot of the stones are, are angled towards the right slightly compared to the rest of the square. I don't know if you can see that, but... But he, he, he sees things like this and makes videos about Obvious. them. It's very fascinating. And it rebukes many criticisms. Isn't there writing on the top? Yes, but that's uh, graffiti and stuff from people who have visited and wanted to say, I was here. Weekly pyramid streams? Probably not. Objections to open air channels for the Great Pyramid include that... Pyramid it uh, research is a, a slow, slow uh, world. Things take time. Would allow the intrusion of rainwater. I could, but then it would be like, then it would be talking about one part of the pyramid each time. Like we could do a, a weekly pyramid uh, uh, lecture with, with Egyptologists virtual. Wind blown sand and bats. But I don't know. I don't but know if the interest is there. It doesn't take a modern day engineering degree to figure out how to put a protective cover over an open hole. With a horizontal channel opening, even it's a so small cool. projection Yo, of stone Thank above you for the 50. it would eliminate all rain. ARS, I don't know which currency that is. If wind blown cool, sand yeah. was a concern, the cha but okay. channel could dentation. Bats crops so we're not scared about animals. I'm just going to skip a little bit ahead. Like, this is really fascinating, too. When they're, when they're going up the pyramids, they're using ropes and they're rappelling down and stuff. Like, this is insanely steep. Seal the channels as necessary. And Not a trip, fun job, it's gonna but hurt. certainly a solvable problem. Next, we need to examine the Queen's Chamber channels where they never opened to the chamber itself. The Southern Channel was... Maybe get an interview going with History for Granite or Ancient Architects? It's very interesting. I've talked to both. They're both amazing people. Um, History for Granite said that in the future he probably wants to join a stream. Uh, but of course, there's some other things first. But he said that uh, when he finds time, he would love to join the stream and talk about pyramids. Uh, and I talked with Ancient Architects, uh, the guy who runs that channel, and he actually said, next time I'm going to Egypt, I want you to come and join the tour. And visit a lot of historical monuments in Egypt, including the Great Pyramid. So, And less than 10 centimeters of the wall was left in place to leave it closed off. 10 centimeters, okay. After Dixon discovered this south channel, he looked to the north wall and chose the most likely location for a course. This is so interesting, though, that, he, that he's understood this. I don't know if Dixon ever wrote this down, but like, okay, you see, uh, you see that there's an opening in one side. You think, huh, if it's like this in the king's chamber, maybe there's one on the other side here, too. You go over and you look at the joints of the blocks and you see, okay, here I could dig. I could dig in this corner. Maybe that, that's where the, the thing is, but it's not. Responding one. It's halfway In doing there. So he guessed the channel would be at the top corner of this block because wall joints would be a natural spot to put it. Makes perfect sense. But Dixon guessed wrong, or at least slightly wrong. He excavated too far to the east because the channel is actually cut into the corners of two wall blocks. The smaller section of the western block is the barrier which Dixon left intact. So you can see that the only reason it was right there in between two instead of one uh, on the corner of one is because it had to align with the other one. Someone has carved a line into the wall about where the channel would open, Super fascinating. but it's not a real joint. The original joints overlaying the channel are here. The remusion that the earliest one this mistake to make that I've never seen the channel's location drawn correctly in books and papers. 
This detail is important because it raises the question, why didn't the builders just chisel out the corner of one block to save the work of dressing a wall in the channel? One more time. This detail is important because it raises the question, why didn't the builders just chisel out the corner of one block to save... To save the work of dressing a wall in the channel. Um, so the, the block itself would just be part of the wall. Right, so if you, if you put this exactly where two blocks meet, the side of that block would then be dressed perfectly. Right? You do two in one. You dress one block perfectly, chisel it, make it all smooth. And then that is also part of, yeah, it's two in one. Because now you have now you had more work. The work of dressing a wall in the channel. The channels turn and drift and show no precise workmanship as they rise in the pyramid. But Only here, down there. at the yeah. Queen's Chamber, the channels needed to be in an exact location. This reveals that the channels are aligned to one thing and one thing only. They are aligned to each other inside the chambers. The pyramid is a monument to symmetry where it can be seen Are these inside. perfectly in the middle of the room? I think they are, right? Just looking at this line on the ceiling? I think they are at least attempted to be perfectly in the middle. The chambers. The pyramid is a monument to symmetry where it can be seen, but out of sight, the channels needed no precise craftsmanship. If everything else is perfect about the pyramids, why do they get so lazy with the tunnels? They, they got, in those words, lacy with everything out of view. Everything you couldn't see. Like, um... Like, it's kind of like this... <laughs> uh... I have a perfect example for you. This is the mentality the Egyptians had when building the pyramids. Ooh, look at me, nice monument, very cool, perfectly everything. And then this is the part you cannot see. Which is, when the tunnel curves, they don't bother. Uh, behind the smooth casing stones, they don't bother. You know? But it gives off the perfect impression be, with, with what you can see and what you cannot see. The logical conclusion is that the Queen's Chamber channels a lot are of things aligned are built this way, to I think. each other because they were meant to be seen, yet remained unfinished like yeah, I think the a chamber lot of are built they this intersect. Way. The King's Chamber channels appear rectangular like the room- This is like, I vacuum my entire room, but I don't vacuum under my couch. Because you're not going to look there. Whom they inhabit, but after they rise the up, room looks the clean. dimensions change to a square similar to the Queen's Chamber channel size. <laughs> The design of I'm the an channels adult, I can do what I want, chat, don't gasp. ...was clearly a point of consideration for the builders. But all this evidence is still contextual, and maybe not enough. It's the chillest time I've ever had with you, thank you so much for such a brave decision to stream it. It's different than what we usually do. I mean, it's not, I mean, I, and I, I am a little worried that, like, I seem like a conspiracy nuthead, and that I'm, like, turning people away from what brought them to my channel in the first place, but, you know, it's something I'm super passionate about. And if I'm, if, if I have to be confined to only streaming the things that, like, would give me the most viewers or would, you know, just be, be one thing, I, I like the ability to stream what I truly enjoy. I think I should, should, as a creator, give myself that freedom, because if not, the things I feel like I can stream become very limited. To put the matter to so, rest. So yes, I, I we like need having that freedom, strong, and it's very that cool that you guys still stick around for things that are not just Trekmania. Doubt that forty-five centuries of time will provoke. We live in an era in which amazing technologies have revealed many secrets of the pyramids, but it won't be lasers or drones or muography or lidar or microgravimetry. And I, and I think it's very easy to get like when, when I got interested in the pyramids, I got really like fascinated by all the conspiracies. What if it's 10,000 years old? What if it... I like this um, stream. <laughs> we watch to be entertained and this definitely is. Thank you, Slim Connell, yeah. No, but I was gonna say with the conspiracy, like, what if it's 10,000 years old? What if the Sphinx is old because of erosion? What if they built this in this location because it lines up with the speed of sound and light and, uh, you know, um, insane numbers? But the more I research it, the more I just appreciate it for the monument it is, and you don't need all the fairy tale 
solutions to find interest in it. It doesn't need to be that magical. For to be like just the reality of it is interesting. No, don't worry. I, I <laughs> don't worry about interrupting. Like like just the mystery. There is a forty meter chamber inside this thing that no one has seen since it was built. Are the, the big void is literally inside there. This thing. This is an actual room inside the pyramid that they know is there. Why do you need the aliens to build this when, when it's like... Just what humans have accomplished on their own is so fascinating already. Right? The scan pyramid's big void. It's a, it's a real chamber. We just haven't seen it yet. It's that void in the path of the vent, so I thought this at first too, but um... In 3D space, it's not. So, uh, the grand gallery that you see here is closer to us from the viewing uh, perspective. Uh, and the big void as well. They're like closer and the shafts are behind. Um, separated by a few meters. So they do not overlap. You cannot go through this shaft and see the big void. But yeah. There, there's more to discover there or photogrammetry, or robots to bring us this final clue. So what's it in the big void? <laughs> well, no, well, no one knows. Uh, people, suspect, people suspect that it's... Uh, if you follow the theory that the pyramid was built with an internal ramp, and that the Grand Gallery was used as a counterweight system, you'd place a lot of heavy things there and use it to help you pull heavy things up in the pyramid. Uh, then it could logically follow that this, the big void could be another similar structure to the Grand Gallery. Because the heaviest stones are above this counterweight. So if you had another similar contraption here, it could help you carry these stones up. And these are, you know, 80, 70 ton stones. Uh, so a lot of people believe it's another ramp used just for construction. Um, but But... There, nobody knows. It could also just be another chamber for whatever purpose. But but Oldest it was there for some reason. They didn't just leave the it kind for no pioneered reason. Pioneered by Vice, Pering, and Petrie, which will reveal the solution. In a monument the size of the Great Pyramid, knowing what to look for is by far the hardest. Now the part. main thing. The main thing Here, you saw. At the opening. Let's try to understand this. Let's everyone dial in our concentration. Let's try to understand exactly what he's saying. I didn't catch it fully live. I, I caught the implication of this, but I didn't catch exactly what he meant. Let's lock in. Let's try to understand this, okay? This is huge. This is huge implications. King's Chamber Northern Channel is where we must search. When looking for clues in a place like this, you don't really expect to find anything. I can't explain the impulse to do it, other than an optimism that any problem can be solved <laughs> with the right mindset. You try to clear your head of a It must just feel futile for him. Like you're looking at something thousands of people have looked at before and you're trying to find something new. And he, and he actually does. Assumptions ...and just take in the stones as you see them. Beneath the garbage and the dust, the construction of the channel appears haphazard. The eastern block was clearly sawed in the upper wall, but beneath it, the rounded edge of a tubular drill formed the bottom. So a tubu tubular drill, real quick. A tub... What is that? It's like a... Is it like a sharp object that they would... Because it's obviously not going to be like a drill like we have now. Something like this? Where they, they, they push that in and then like twist it to like... You know... Uh, cause friction and then... Saw off parts? Is that something along the lines that what we're going for? A tree trunk drill. Tree trunk drill. I don't, I don't think it's one of these. I think that I don't I don't know if they had them. A tubular drill. Drilling granite with a large copper pipe.
So they add water and they twist this copper pipe to cause friction. Today we with Nikolai Vasyutin have a new experiment with the name Big Pipe. Under the code name Large Pipe. I feel like it's not much of a secret code if you call it exactly what it is. <laughs> it has a really secret mission, guys. We're gonna use a large pipe to drill and we're gonna call it code name Large Pipe. Да, опять снова сверлим, но сверлим уже большим отверстием диаметром почти. Медная пила. Copper nails. Прозвучат претензии или что-то найдут у нас, чего не было у древних египтян. Okay. So it's copper attached to a log? And then f sat in place and ah, they just have a copper like okay, on the on the wood and then they twist this and the copper is gonna kill anything that's so that's that's softer than it. But this is also harder material, I think. Ну что, пора. Yeah, this is granite. Copper plus sand plus water, uh, works. It's very tedious and very time consuming, but it works. You need the sand and you need the water, and they've done this with copper sauce as well. It's just so slow. And some people believe they had better tools than this, but, you know. Uh, in in the archaeological record, they've only found copper tools. Yeah. Okay. So so okay. So back to back to what we were looking at. We're seeing that some form of tubular drilling. I can agree. This looks very curved. This is not what you get if you like straight up just boom, like you know, saw this thing straight down. You you will not get this here. This looks very round, right? But on the other side, we see a different sawing pattern, right? Okay. Corner. In contrast. Oh, sorry. Let's just go a little bit back. Did edge of a tubular drill form to the bottom corner? In contrast, the western wall is less smooth. Couldn't this be erosion? I think there wouldn't be enough. Like you would see the same erosion patterns on both walls. Uh, it would be weird if it's only here. Right? And there's no, like, wind erosion or water erosion, it would, it, you would see similar patterns at least somewhere on this wall. But the bottom corner Even if was, was erosion. perfectly squared by a saw cut in its half of the floor. This fact by itself is interesting. It shows the builders worked the two stones differently based upon their tools and constraints at the time. You can even see on the wall where the saw marks change, perhaps due to the block being cut in multiples. Yeah, so the sawing here is very different from here. Significantly different. Okay. Stages. Just when you think there's nothing more to see, a detail emerges in the western corner on the floor. The sharp line of the saw cut ends. It is replaced with the rounded corner of a tube. Right, so here it's very sharp, very close to the wall, super sharp. And then it becomes this uh, skate ramp kind of thing. This like rounded edge. Tubular drill in the first 25 centimeters. Of yeah, very clear. First 25 centimeters is curved and then super sharp. Of the channel. The channel opening, however, does not have a rounded corner. The first centimeter or two of the channel's western corner was also squared with a straight cut. Yeah? This right here is the miracle the Great Pyramid left for us to see. I'll preface with the disclaimer that deciphering tool marks on stone can devolve into reading tea leaves, but here we've got a very strong signal.
Why would the builders use an entirely different method of cutting for the opening to the northern channel? The answer you've already arrived at. <laughs> we did not arrive at this. This is very complicated, but... Well, the, 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 the answer to this... For the opening to the northern channel. The answer you've already arrived at is the openings were originally sealed in the chamber and then cut open at a final stage of construction. The exact way this occurred is not... They were originally sealed? And then open. So what he's saying is that exactly like the outmost part here was sealed. The first 25 or so centimeters. And then when it straightens out on the left side, on the western side, it was then... Uh, th that's where the tunnel led to before it was reopened. Not clear. And there are some... Only the first three centimeters? ...straight saw cuts on the floor, which extend next to the tube drill. The builders may have opted to leave the channel partially cut. Oh, just the first centimeters. Just to literally here. Okay, wait. And then cut open. I'm going, I'm going back. I'm going back. The opening to the northern channel. The answer, we the right answer at. you've already arrived at is the openings were originally sealed in the chamber and then cut open at a final stage of construction. The exact way this occurred is not clear. And there are some straight saw cuts on the floor, which extend next to the tube drill. The builders may have opted to leave the channel partially cut in order to give themselves a reference line and save some work later. But what's truly remarkable is that the inner saw cut on the this western floor sequence. does yeah. not overlap the tube drill pyramids? at all. It also cuts deeper into the wall than the tube drill. Anyone who has ever cut with a straight saw knows that inertia would cause it to overlap if the tube drill section had been cut first. In, explain this. Because I am stupid. Uh, inertia would cause it to overlap the tube drill if the tube drill section had been cut first. So this goes deeper in and... And... And it wouldn't. <laughs> I'm so lost. If there is a groove, the drill goes in that groove. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, so you couldn't reverse the order. You would still see the saw marks. Okay. We can thus get an unmistakable sequence of cuts in the west. So you can understand the order this was done in, based on what is presented here. Western corner of the channel. Cut one, cut two, cut three. The third and final straight cut is very interesting because it shows the builders wanted a nicely squared channel opening without rounded corners at the bottom. Right, so they... This guy, Sigma, is... First... Jang Crab gifted a tier one. Help, help me with this. Zero, Wait, zero. help me with this chat. I'm, my brain is exploding. Help me with this. They first cut the tunnel itself, right? Pretty sharp. Okay, all cool. Then they use the tubular drill to open it. And then three, they cut nice edges to have a, a, a rectangular shape. Yes? Okay. Okay, sorry. That it might not be that hard for you, but that was hard for me to understand. Sharp, then tube, and then cut other side. Yeah. A nice okay, so here. So first, for the entire tunnel, basically, it was quite sharp. When they got to the entrance here, and they wanted to unseal it, they first used the tubular drill on both sides. And then lastly, they use a very sharp angle here. And you can tell this order because if you reversed it, you would have these saw marks uh, elsewhere. Okay. 
nicely squared channel opening without rounded corners at the bottom. Unfortunately, the eastern side is too damaged to see this effect, but it also likely received a sharpened corner. Even with this clear evidence, I still wanted more. You can never be too sure when studying something as old as the Great Pyramid. So when traveling to Egypt last year, I made a point of taking my time and you can getting really the see how sharp the just corner is. right to inspect the eastern wall. Amazingly, the polish on the wall changes at the same point where the tube drill ends. And the tube drilling in the eastern corner the polish on the wall the eastern wall. Amazingly, the polish on the wall like right there? Can we agree like it's right there? So the wall is more damaged leading up to this from the tube drill. But then where this outcrop is, it's very clearly different, no? <laughs> changes at the same point where the tube drill Like there's a clear thing happening right here. Like uh, at this area here. At the, fir at the first 25 centimeter? So here. Uh, maybe, maybe even earlier. <laughs> Welcome to the vibe. Oh my god, Jan Crab. Thank you so much for the nine gifted. Sorry, I'm getting very caught up in this. So right here, there's a change. Okay. The polish on the wall changes at the same point where the tube drill ends. And the tube drilling in the eastern... But it, to me, looks like it kept going. Like, isn't these tube drill marks too? Let him talk, yeah, yeah. Corner appears smaller before the point where the saw cut begins on the western floor. Perhaps a slightly smaller tubular drill was used for the final cut. Every surface of the blocks forming the bottom of this channel appear as though it was originally sealed off. Rainy, we now so. have a direct comparison for the channels in the King's Chamber and Queen's Chamber. The wall goes from smooth to rough, yeah. Finished, unfinished. The reason for leaving the channel sealed up until the final stage may be due to hmm. what Petrie observed at the Queen's Chamber floor. If you go back to Red Circle, you can see the difference in polish. Small point. The polish cut begins in the east. Oh yeah, no, yeah, okay. So he is talking about this, that the polish is very fine here and then it gets rough there. Now I understand, okay. Now I understand. So they used a, probably a better tubular drill for the last part, for the closest part, to get a nicer... Like, because keep in mind, this is below eye level, right? So when you're walking, you have to like actually dig in and like bow down and look to see this, maybe. But here now you see it perfectly fine. Western corner appears smaller before the point where the saw cut begins on the western floor. Perhaps a slightly smaller tubular drill was used for the final There's a clear cut. difference right there. Every yeah. surface of the blocks forming the bottom of this channel appear as though- When the dude broke the queen's chamber walls, he'd done that because he'd seen the channels in the king's chamber? Yeah. He saw like a slightly different outcrop on the wall and he decided to dig through. And then he found one channel and he thought, oh, if this is like the king's chamber, there should be one on the other side. And then he found both. It was originally sealed off. We now have a direct comparison for the channels in the King's Chamber and Queen's Chamber. Finished. Unfinished. Oh my god, Unfixel, thank you so much as well for the five gifted and baby crocodile, thank you. Okay. The reason for leaving the channel this sealed up Sigma until the final dude. stage may be due to what Petrie observed at the Queen's Chamber floor. The chambers were filled with masonry and sand to safely get the ceilings in place. This I didn't understand as well when you watched the first time. The chamber was filled with masonry and sand to safely get the ceilings in place. What do they need the sand on the floor for? I didn't understand that.
to hold the rocks in place. Oh, like a carpet. Ah, so you, yeah, of course you build the floor first, and then you don't want to damage the floor with like an 80-ton granite block. Or, you know, these are smaller in the Queen's Chamber, but still. No? For compaction. They fill the whole room? <laughs> Hope you will continue with the pyramid streams. You remind me so much myself when looking at these videos. You love the pyramids? Dude, me too. Me too. I'm, gr I'm glad we all have uh, this fascination for it. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand. So, but okay. So they, they filled the room with sand to aid in the placing of the ceiling. Okay. Uh, the so, in some way. If they filled it like completely. Filled with masonry and sand to safely get the ceilings in place and then emptied once the heavy construction was complete. The channels were kept sealed so they wouldn't be clogged or damaged. So if you fill the entire room with sand, it makes perfect sense to think, oh shit, I don't want sand to get inside this, there's going to be a hell to get out of this small thing, so let's seal it. If, if the sand didn't go above this point, there would be no reason to seal it, right? So that's why they were like, yeah, okay, shit, we gotta Edge pack this up. Construction. We now have a complete picture of the channels and okay. can be confident their purpose was for ventilation because they were opened at a final stage. While the air channel solution is an old one, let me quickly reassure you to not be disappointed with this outcome. The nature of my discovery is not really the purpose for the channels. The credit for that still goes to Vice, Hill, and Pairing, who risked their lives and successfully restored ventilation to the Great Pyramid in 1837. The revelation of this new evidence is not that the channels were for air, but who the air is for. Yeah, this is the big question, chat. You build the greatest stone structure of your time. It's meant to be a funeral complex. Burying the pharaoh and then locked up. That's how all the pyramids were built. They, they blocked them up with stones afterwards. Why do you need air to come through? There's not going to be any guards. It's only going to be the pharaoh resting inside. But obviously the air was useful for something. Workers, probably not. The chamber would be completed. But maybe, and this is like maybe... Like, how dense would the air be when, you, when you're ready to bury the pharaoh? Is it like too dense to the point you can't walk in there, place the guy, and then get out? Not the workers. For as many people have intuitively guessed, in ancient Egypt, workers were not- Like, the air in this pyramid is still gonna be better than, like, Mount Everest. Not given the privilege of fresh air. Nor would a monument with the scale and grandeur of the Great Pyramid be constructed to accommodate workers in such a manner. And as we now know, the ventilation for the Great Pyramid was not available until the construction of the chambers was nearly complete. This is the best type of discovery. Tourism is a good answer, but it was built 4,000 years ago. These, these, these tunnels were built with the original construction. No dude getting buried i mean maybe Th there's a reality where like the pyramid was kept open for some time after the king was buried so that like people could uh and egyptian people could come in and like give their uh offerings to the king or something right like like almost you know like a, like a religious thing like, this would be the old equivalent of going into a church. The kind that brings with it new questions and fascinating places to for pay the respects to the to pharaoh, go. yeah. No longer must we struggle to see how the channels burrow through the pyramid. But, Instead, but this is very unprecedented. And that's what you have to compare it to. Like, every other pyramid has... Ah! Uh, ah, uh, I mean... I think History for Granted has theorized that the uh, Bent Pyramid had a, uh, had a similar thing. 
where it was some earlier chambers that people could go to. And we get to follow the channels towards a greater yeah, understanding the of the ancient has some past similar features. and the people who lived and died there. But no air conditioning. If you ever <laughs> doubt the merits of your own curiosity, dear viewers, I want you to remember one thing about this video. Remember that since 1872, Every this is very inspirational. If you've ever doubted the merits of your own curiosity, I want you to remember one thing about this video. One thing about this video. Remember that since 1872, every person who has entered the Great Pyramid, stared down this channel, and wondered what it all meant, has had the most important clue, quite literally, under their nose. It's a great reminder that the work this is never finished, this. and that the world is full of wonder, for those who might seek it out. At the Great Pyramid, the research has barely gotten started. <sighs> the search isn't just for answers, it's for better questions. I like, like, it's really powerful, because it's like, there are still answers to be found. You just gotta have an open mindset towards discovery and actually, like, you know, critically assess things. That's how he's discovered everything he has so far. It's very easy to take for granted that everything is known about the pyramid, everything is known about this, about that. You can never discover new things, but he, he literally does. Uh, Bearstone, thank you for the sub. I've waited a long time to share this discovery, but in the next video coming soon, you will get answers to the new questions that have been brought. Then at last, the next chapter for the pyramids of Egypt can truly begin. Thank wow, thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Just got here, can you restart from the beginning? Of course. Sorry, sorry you missed it. We can watch it again. Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore 25 speed? ancient Egypt. Please subscribe <laughs> and together. <laughs> I think watching it twice is enough for me, I'll be honest. But guys, huge shout out to History for Granite. Uh, it's an amazing video and his channel is amazing too. Um, I really hope you guys check out his channel. Do subscribe, please. We started today with him being at 186k subscribers. I see he's at 187k now, which is fantastic. That makes me very happy. That makes me happy to talk about pyramids. Uh, to see that he his channel, um, his channel does does also grow and prosper. And he has many great videos. Uh, if I were to recommend you some that you should watch after this, if you're more curious. The ones about the casing stones, the closest look at how the pyramids were built, bottom right here, this is an amazing video. It goes into detail about the casing stone placements. Uh, the one about the bent pyramid, he finds something that no one's ever seen before. Um, some of the oldest histories. This one was very interesting to me. Some of the oldest accounts. The internal ramp theory. This is the go-to for learning about internal ramp theory. Great one as well. Um, and another video is also this one. The Great Pyramid Reveals How It Was Built, also about the internal ramp theory. Um, and the other ones are, are fantastic too, but these are like the main ones. So yeah, I watched it all basically. And another great channel as well, while, while we're at it, uh, Ancient Architects. Oh my god, Ancient Architect. Uh, he publishes a lot of pyramid content as well. Just recently, one about the, uh, the Grand Gallery and what it could have been used for and how uh, it was likely used as a counterweight to lift stones. Also a lot of other cool uh, ancient sites like Gobekli Tepe and old statues and old settlements. Kaharan Tepe and caves in Turkey and stuff. It's it's really fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Uh, another great channel, although uh, mostly focusing on debunking uh, bullshit theories, is the world of antiquity. This channel is uh, focusing a lot on, like, if you ever see a crazy short about... I mean, let's, let's watch some of his shorts, because they're quite fascinating. <laughs> Uh, for example, this one. This is the Ben Ben Stone. I came across it at the old Egyptian museum. 
and it is not made of anything from this planet. It's made of black granite, which is found in abundance on Earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yes, it is a stone from space. They could not find any of the materials that made it. His main focus is just the bunking people that are wrong. There's a well-known black grand. Oh, These sorry. These people had a detailed map of the solar system. No, oh my god, do not- yeah, well, okay, well, you know. 6,000 years ago that they wrote in clay. So if I ever need to get to Neptune, they've got me covered. It showed the sun at the center it's and crazy. all the planets. Oh, all 11 planets. In the correct orbit, with the correct size, uh, not, not necessarily like, like the ratio, but this one's bigger than that one. And so some are bigger and some are smaller, but where are the orbits? They they had a knowledge right. of the cosmos in some strange way. Yeah, in some strange way. It's weird how this contradicts their writings, which say there are five planets. And they also had depictions of these very tall, strange-looking figures. Okay, so we're off the Sumerians now with little monkey people on their yeah. laps. Their daughters? Yeah. <laughs> and they had the symbol for DNA, with like the double helix DNA. Yeah. They have that, and that's, that's crazy. Looks kind of like it if you squint a I mean, like, he, he, he debunks a lot of stuff. So. It's a lot of wild stuff, so. Yeah, no, um, okay. But I think that's, I think that's a pretty good pyramid stream, guys. I, I am feeling a little bit sick, so I don't, I think I want to go into any Trackmania today, or, or stream much longer. Um, hey, your random question. Where do you get your rings from? It's very different all over the place. Uh, some places are Norwegian uh, goldsmith chain called um, uh, Birklum. And the other ones I bought in the US at, I think, a Macy's. <laughs> so... <laughs> No, it's, it's honestly not more complex than I went to a store, saw a cool ring, and thought, oh, I want this. But yeah, uh, guys, I think, I think I'm going to call it a stream. Have you had fun today? Have you learned something new? Has it been of interest? One in the chat if you, if you learned something today. A little different. Tomorrow, I'll probably stream and I'll be back with more Trackmania. If not tomorrow, then in, in two days, I'll see how I'm feeling. If I'm a little sick or not. Hopefully I recover well with my voice. Oh my god, loud. <laughs> Very loud. Thank you guys so much for the support today. Thank you to everyone. Uh, Blaze and Heat. Thank you, Baby Crocodile. Norwegian Sepro. Coach Kame. Also, gotta say the people who, who, who subbed earlier when I was doing my waffling. Amazing stuff, guys. We shall raid... A streamer. I'm just looking at my list of people who are live. Oh, this is a bit intense. This is a bit intense. This is a bit intense. Yes. This is more cozy. Oh, this is very cozy. I like the song. Uh, perhaps you could raid uh, Granati today. Granati's playing a... Oh, this is the wrong Granati. Uh, competition. Okay, chat. Thank you so much for joining for Pyramid Adventures. I'll be back soon. I'll see you guys soon. Much love. And remember to not take your uh, history for granted. I'll see you guys very soon. Have a great night. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Have a good one.